uh, ready to roll. Um, good evening. Welcome to the October. Wait a second. This is not October. The, the, ah, the notes are wrong. It is November the 10th. <laughs> and um, so, so uh, I, I, now you have the uh, disclosure that there is a, uh, a, a, a tele, teleprompter except as a static document with notes. Um, this is a teleconference meeting with complete Streets Commission members, city staff, and members of the public participating remotely to ensure proper social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. I would like to introduce the complete Streets Commission members and staff who are present. I'm Chair Adina Levin. Commissioners present include Brian Altman, Katie Baruzzi, Jackie Sebrian, John Cromie, and Lydia Lee. And commissioners who are not here this evening include Sally Cole, J.K. Jensen, and Elizabeth King. Staff present include Kevin Chen, Fu Nguyen, Hugh Lauch, and Patrick Palmer. Um, Patrick, can you please provide instructions to the Complete Streets Commission and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed from here? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Levin, and members of the Complete Streets Commission. Welcome, everyone, to the November 10th Complete Streets Commission meeting, and thank you for attending. At this time, we will ask that the members of the commission please remain on screen for the duration of the meeting. You will control your own webcams and microphones. Staff will engage webcams and microphones to make presentations, then respond to the members of the commission. For members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide public comment, after the chair calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, please engage the raise hand feature. I will then have the ability to open your microphone and you can provide your public comment to the complete Police commission. Uh, for the members of the public who are calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you, you can also press star nine to raise your virtual hand. Uh, that concludes the instructions, and I return the meeting to the chair. All right. Uh, thank you very much. So we will now move on to reports and announcements under which staff and commission members may communicate general information of interest regarding matters within the jurisdiction of the commission. No commission discussion or action can occur on any of the presented items. Um, so does staff have reports and announcements to share? Yes, I do. Good evening, Madam Chair and everyone in attendance. Uh, so two quick items that I would like to update the commission on. Uh, first and foremost, the city council approved the left turn restriction at 105-125 Constitution Drive. Uh, if you recall, this is the item that was before the commission uh, a few months ago uh, regarding a term restriction that, that was um, staff recommended to be to be lifted. Uh, in addition to the approval, the city council has also requested a check-in on the uh, current and upcoming pedestrian safety measures of the, uh, the Bayfront area uh, within a six month period. So as we have a brief discussion on this at the last meeting, Staff's intention is to come back to, to the commission with uh, some pre preliminary recommendations, and and have a hopefully have a, a, a really fruitful discussion about how we can improve the Bayfront area uh, in the upcoming months. So definitely happy to recognize that uh, it is being formalized by the city council as well. Uh, so also just before I conclude. Happy to announce that the Congress uh, passed the infrastructure bill. So for those of you that might be following it, uh, Middle Avenue crossing uh, is, uh, there's some budget attached to that bill. Uh, so the passing of that infrastructure bill is certainly great news for the city of Middle Park as well. So happy to make that announcement. And with that, I will conclude my reports and announcements. Thank you. <laughs> Um, let's see, um, can we, uh, uh, has staff confirmed that that project remains in there? Because I had read a news story that earmarks were removed, but if staff has confirmation that that project is in there, that is great news. Maybe if I may, uh, Kevin, so uh, Hugh Louch, Assistant Public Works Director. So there were two bills, the bill that had the earmarks in it has not yet advanced the Build Back Better bill. So it's, we didn't actually, we don't actually have the money uh, in the bill yet, unfortunately. Uh, but the infrastructure bill, which was sort of the reauthorization piece of it did advance. Um, so there's still some limbo there, yes, about whether or not we'll get the, um, uh, the federal earmark money for that crossing. Great, thanks for that clarification. 
Sorry about that. Um, let's see. Um, so we are now moving on to public comment under which the public may address complete streets commission on any item that is not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda. And therefore, the commission cannot respond to non-agendized issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. So um, let's see, do we have any members of the public with a hand raised? Uh, yes, I see uh, two members of the public with a uh, hand. Um, uh, we'll start with Pamela Jones. Good evening, commissioners. Um, thank you, first of all, for um, paying attention and taking care of with recommendations, what's going on with our streets and making sure that we're as safe as we can be. My name is Pamela Jones. I'm a resident of Menlo Park in District 1, and I live on Hollyburn. Uh, I was traveling through the Midwest, anyway, uh, a couple years ago, and I was in a little town where they had stop signs that when you drove up to the stop sign, there were flashing lights that were surrounded the, um, the stop sign. And it really made me pay attention to driving. And I was watching other people, because I ended up at a restaurant at one of the corners, and people really paid attention to it. And what made me think of it is uh, the children that were being um, that were being injured. I think it was in the downtown area. There was two or three incidences about uh, maybe three or four weeks ago. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Again, thank you for your work. Thank you very much. Um, so we will now move on to another member of the public with a hand raised. Uh, uh, Bill Kirsch, uh, esteemed former member of this uh, uh, commission. Uh, Bill. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me all right? Adina? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, yeah. Esteemed yeah. commissioners, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I actually have a comment for later on under one of the agenda items, but uh, the middle crossing, I'm interested to know uh, is there any other uh, pots of money, any other funding available if we don't get government earmarks to uh, pursue the undercrossing? Thank you. Okay, um, and that is a good question and um, staff may have more information. Um, I will have a little bit more information under our committee report as well. Um, with some information that was excerpted and uh, posted to uh, Metropolitan Transportation Commission um, such that I am not making it up. Um, so does staff have any other information in response to this question at this time? And if not, we can take it uh, later in subcommittee reports. I think um, if I may, what I would just say is that, um, yes, there are certainly always a lot of different sources that we can apply for. But one of the things to note about the new infrastructure bill is that um, it has continued a trend towards more investment in transit and more investment in active transportation in particular, and it creates a number of new uh, programs that will, of course, have to be have regulations and one thing and another. So it'll be a little while before those will be figured out, but um, they do appear to be new opportunities at the federal level uh, that could be uh, relevant to us and others. Um, and of course, all of that is TBD and uncertain right now, but um, yeah, it does appear that there might be some good opportunities. Great, uh, thank you very much. And that is uh, generally good news. Um, and I am not seeing any additional hands from members of the public. So we will move on to regular business under which the commission considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require commission approval. And uh, the first, 
excuse me, of these is to approve the minutes for the Complete Chief Commission meeting of October 13th, 2021. Um, are there any uh, clarifications requested from commission members before I take public comment, if any, on the minutes? Uh, I'm not seeing any comments from commissioners on the minutes. Are there any members of the public who have any comments on the minutes? I'm not seeing any members of the public with comments on the minutes. So with this, do we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve the minutes. I'll second. All right. Um, can staff help us vote? Okay, great. So for those commissioners, uh, except Commissioner Sibrian and Cromie, because um, you'll be abstaining from this vote. For the rest of the commissioners, if you'd like to vote yes, if you can just please raise your hand, hold it up for a couple of seconds just so that I can. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so we will move on to agenda item E2 which is to recommend the adoption of resolution number 2021-5 to remove five parking spaces fronting 2225 Sharon Road and um, uh, staff will introduce the item. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, at this point, I would like to ask uh, Fu Nguyen to just go ahead and turn on his webcam and also go ahead and prepare to share the screen. Just a brief introduction, Fu is one of our engineering technicians for the transportation division. Uh, definitely a, a valuable member of the team and his duty typically consists of our day-to-day -day city functionalities, but also um, uh, overseeing some of the, the projects. So this is one of them. This is his first time presenting to the commission. So uh, definitely welcome, Fu. Uh, you can take it away. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, can I have the share screen ability, please? Currently, I cannot share my screen. Okay, uh, let's see, Patrick, can you? Great, let me. Go ahead and give you another try, please. Sure. Okay. There we go. Thanks. All right. So good evening, uh, Commission Chair, Commission members, member of the community, and everyone else are here tonight. As Kevin introduced me earlier, my name is Fu. I am uh, one of the engineer technician in the transportation division. The reason I'm here tonight sorry, is to sorry, present sorry. to you a project. Just go ahead, Kevin. You off. Can you um, go ahead and full size your screen so that it's more legible for, for everyone? Is it again? I'm sorry. I Can you um, full, full screen the, uh, the presentation? Sure, sure. Yes. Give me okay. a sec. All right. Can you see it now? Is it better? Um, I believe you're sharing your other screen, so you might have to unshare and then share. Right now you're still sharing the, the one with uh, the headlines. So yeah, I'm gonna now go ahead and share the screen that is presenting the entire presentation. Right, currently I'm sharing one screen with the projects. Okay, let's see. I think if you go into view, you can say, full screen presentation or something like that. I don't know, I don't use this. I haven't used PowerPoint in a while, but you may want to just do that. Is that what you're talking about, Kevin? Uh, yeah, but I, I think there's, I don't know if food, do you have two screens going on right now? Because I No, I have only one. I have, have only one? one screen, yeah. Okay, so go ahead and um, try, try it again, do a full screen. Okay.
Um, you know what? If not, I can I can go ahead and do it on my end as well. So actually, it's loading up right now, Kevin. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, for some reason it's, it's, it takes some time to load up. So right now it's it's up only 14%. <laughs> okay. You know what? I'm I'm gonna go ahead and pull it up on my screen. So can you see my screen then? I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you and then Okay. Yeah. I mean I'm gonna share my screen and then we can go from there. Okay. All if right. I can, fully, if I can just have you confirm that you can see my screen with the entire presentation full size. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see it. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Go ahead. All right, great. Uh, yes. So, good evening, uh, Commission Chair, Commission members, members of the community, and everyone out here tonight. Um, my name is Fu. I work in the transportation division as an injured technician. Uh, the reason I'm here tonight is to present to you a project that's been proposed and hopefully we can get your approval on it. And that project is the parking, remove and installation of red curve along 2,225 Sharon Road. Back in the summers, uh, next slide please. Back in the summers, we receive concern from uh, residents who live in within this uh, apartment complex uh, saying that every single time when they move out from the uh, existing driveway, next slide please. This is the, the driveway that they're existing from the apartment complex. So the people, when they're here, right at the lip of the driveway, they're having a hard time uh, safely enter into the roadway, either to the left or to the right, because of very limited um, side distance. So I went out there, next slide, please. So I went out there two times to verify the concerns and indeed, there's so many cars parked there, very, very close to the driveway, especially as you can see the photo on the right side. Currently, there's a school there with construction activities going on. So in addition of the people who live at the apartment complex park their vehicle along this curvy section of the road, we also have many large vehicles from the construction crew parked there. And from time to time, we also have delivery truck parked there, uh, which make the problem even worse. And especially here as a curve, so, so the site of a life site is very, very limited. And based on my uh, observation, this is the blind spot waiting for collision to occur. Uh, so next slide, please. So according to ASHTO, which is the association, American Association of uh, state highway and transportation official stating that if a street speed limit is 25 miles per hour, the stop inside distance required would be 155 feet. When a one stop inside distance of 155 feet achieved, then the light of sight will increase significantly compared to what it is now. So in order for us to achieve that, the two sides, both the left and the right side of the driveway must be clear of obstruction. So based on my few measurements, on the left right here, currently there is 15 feet of red curve existing. We need an, a total of 45 feet. So additionally, we need 30 more feet of red curve. So that equivalent to two parking spaces. Um, on the other side, next slide please, because of, of, of a curvy road, so we need a longer red curve uh, section. There is 17 feet existing. We need another 60, so total, there will be 77 feet red curve needed, and that equivalent to three parking spaces. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, I'm proposing of remove five parking space and turn that into 30 feet of red curve on one side and 60 feet are red curve on other sides. Uh, next slide, please. 
So in terms of uh, public outreach concerns, uh, we have sent postcards out to people who live within the 500 foot radius of the projects. We also place airframe poster there. And uh, three days ago, I received email from uh, a person stating that he is fully support of the remove of the parking spaces and convert that into a uh, red curve zone. Um, so with that, next slide, please. So with that, I uh, would like to conclude my presentation and uh, I'm more happy to answer any question you might have or any um, uh, question from the member of community. And um, I thank you for your times and your consideration. All right, well, uh, thank you very much. And um, first I wanna start with members of the commission. Is, uh, if the members of the commission have any questions about this, so we'll take questions first, and then we'll see if any members of the public have comments, and then we will bring it back to the commission for discussion and potential motions. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Altman. Hi, Hi. thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I am the drive-by there four times. Um, just because it's on my way to someplace else. Um, and of the four times I drove by there, there was, um, there was no cars parked uh, along the street, except for um, during school hours. And uh, you know, when it's school hours, it was pretty busy. Um, you said it's 25 miles an hour. Shouldn't it be 15 miles an hour in the school zone? Yeah, the, other, the other question I had was, it looked like there was just 10 cars parked in that parking lot. Um, and the four times I drove by it, the same eight cars were there. So I'm wondering if people were working from home and how many cars do you think this actually serves? Okay, I can, I can answer to that. Um, I don't know what time of the day that you drove uh, by the area. Um, I went out there in the weekday one time at nine o'clock night-ish and then another one about three-ish of a Thursday afternoon. Um, on a Thursday afternoon, indeed, uh, the car wasn't that too dense, wasn't dense as, 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 as the person who, who actually showed the concerns. But then uh, on the other occasion, I went out there in the morning, it was a lot. Uh, so oh, I assume, so or I believe because, because the construction crew are there oh. and by three o'clock they might be gone already. So, so let's say a person go in the morning and the construction uh, vehicle park two days and, and that will occur to create the problem as, as I um, present earlier, as far as the 25 speed limit. Yes, uh, we, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, um, I think we have another project that uh, proposed 50 mile, uh, 15 uh, mile per hour at a school zone. Um, and that's a different project that I'm not very familiar with. But when I went out there uh, physically, uh, a, a, a speed post, say it's 25 miles currently there. So that's how my base is from. I was out there at 10, 10 2, 4, and 8. 10, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 8 o'clock. Um, just, just to answer, uh, sorry, this is uh, Kevin. So just to answer Commissioner Altman, the question about 25 versus 15. So there, uh, there will be. I think you're definitely referring to a project that is going on, like Lou was saying, that will eventually have a 15 mile per hour zone for school frontages. And those are typically assessed uh, with a sign that would say something along the line of uh, when children are present. So typically uh -huh. this is dedicated to drop off, pick up time, lunch time, uh, e even doing a heavy activity where you see kids on the street. That's when the 15 miles per hour um, speed zone will be enforced. However, outside of the periods, the street will continue to be 25. So for instance, maybe on the weekend where there are no kids present, those would be um, signed at 25 miles per hour. So it's a, uh, yeah. Just, uh, just a quick, quick follow-up question, just to my second question. In the parking lot that is part of that T, the parking, the actual parking lot where the cars come out, if you go look at it, um, you had a slide that came close to it. Yeah, so right there, that parking lot. Okay. That one, right there. One. Yeah. If you go down the parking lot, there's actually only spots for 10 cars. Mm -hmm. And the 10 cars that I saw in there, um, I was just wondering, if, you know, because of the 
pandemic, things, you know, work patterns have changed. Right. Over four times I visited, the same eight cars were parked there. So I'm just wondering if, you know, I, I kind of question just how, how this got, how, you know, is, is this of, of the four initiatives that are for sharing, sharing drive uh, in the TPM, why is this one coming to the top? Uh, I, I think you're referring to the T, TMP, maybe? The TMP, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, okay. so, so this is not, you know, this is something, what we consider to be sort of our daily operation where a, a resident that lives in a certain area would um, come bring that to staff's attention. This is something that's outside of the TMP, um, which is pretty basically why this is sort of being brought forth right now. I would say that I guess the question to that would be, you know, typically when a resident of a, even if it's a single family house, you know, if they, they they come to the city and say that their driveways are lacking the proper sight distance and visibility, you know, it is our duty to go out there and assess that situation. And if that's if we are indeed uh, our assessment confirms that, uh, then it is our duty to, to kind of take action accordingly. So definitely recognizing sort of the um, you know, the overall structure, maybe, maybe you see those eight cars, but at the end of the day, if it's a safety issue, I think we really need to address that. Thank you. So uh, moving on, uh, Commissioner Bruzzi has a hand. Uh, Katie, are you muted? Yeah, I was muted, but I couldn't, I was, Got, I've been going back and forth between Google Maps and the presentation, so I needed to <laughs> find the place to unmute myself. Um, so so I, one question I had actually, um, I, I share Brian's larger picture questions about like, I see places all over town where I think site visibility is an issue. Um, the accident data don't show accidents here. You know, like I appreciate the service to people, but I could point to a bunch of places downtown where I think like, you know, the situation's a little more dire. Um, but given that this is what's happening today and we could make this go away fast, right? Like an incremental improvement, I'm, I'm okay with that. But I did wonder when I was looking at the at the Google Street View, um, I noticed that on the other side of the street where there's a where there's a driveway exit from the school, there's also a really short red curb. And like not to not to make things even harder for people who are parking on the street there, but I'm wondering if, you know, it would feel maybe extra weird to like fix one site angle issue while there's another one across the street and not fix that one too. And so that was something I had a question about. And then I guess to the question about the parked cars, I'm wondering um, in some parts of town, we have uh, ha like dense housing where we've grandfathered in people being able to park overnight on the street I know there's a section of Middle Avenue where that's the case. Um, and there was a section on Alma for a while where that was the case. Is this also one of those places? Do you know that, Kevin? Or, or um, if overnight parking is allowed? Yeah. Right, so so unfortunately, I, I don't have that exact information. It is, um, I know that if you are in zone, R3 and R2, so basically a multimodal residential area, a multi-family residential, then you technically could park overnight. Um, okay. I, I would suspect given kind of the land uses around the area, maybe you could, but I, I don't quote me on that. I, I would want to verify that. If so that could be the card that, that Brian saw. The other question I had is I couldn't find the speed survey, um, but I've seen people drive pretty fast around there and I'm wondering if the speed survey indicated that people are really driving like within the close to or at 25 miles an hour is the 85th percentile a lot higher mm -hmm. there. What, yeah. what was the, what did you guys find when you were looking at the speed? Uh, I don't have that information ahead of me, in front of me. I think when we look at the speed we were looking at um, as part of the, the survey, I believe because of the, we most likely would have seen something close to probably between 25 to 28 would be, would okay. be my guess. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, those, anyway, those are my, those are my questions. With, uh, just to recap, should we be looking at the other side of the street to bigger philosophical questions about, you know, if this is something we do, should we be looking more thoroughly at other areas in the city where there are more accidents? Um, and, uh, 
the speed. I was curious about that as well. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, um, so yeah, did, did staff look at the other side of the street too, or does it make sense to do that too? Yeah, we can certainly take that as a consideration and then um, proceed with some evaluation for the driveway across the street. We we'll certainly want to reach out to the school as well, just to get their opinion about that. Because um, I, I certainly recognize what um, Commissioner Bruisi mentioned, which is you know, given, given the history of our city, if we really look at every single corner, um, we'll probably find something. <laughs> so um, we we'll definitely want to take that into consideration as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, 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 Commissioner Bruzzi, does that, does that sufficiently answer your question, or, or should we ask like a more forceful question about whether it makes sense to do to have a like a proactive project on sight lines? Um, let's hold that and think about that later, because uh, I okay. know we have a lot of stuff to get through. Uh, yeah, Commissioner, we have questions too. Okay. Uh, uh, great. And uh, now Commissioner Lee. Hey, so I wanted to echo Katie's um, observation that the speeds on the street are pretty high from what I've observed. I've been here both by car and bicycle, and um, I've been surprised by how the turn there, how, how fast people feel like they can take that turn. Um, I, I also am curious to know, um, does Kevin or or is it Fu? I'm sorry, what is it? Fu? Fu, do you know what the width of the street is from like curb to curb there? Yeah, we can do it. Because it, it feels like a wide street to me, which I think I think just visually there's something about just maybe how open it feels that might encourage people to speed. So if we're taking away parking for cars, I mean taking away parking for cars is, you know, totally understandable in this case, because I could, I see all those um, driveways on that street. And I always wonder, in addition to the houses, right, uh, in addition to the school pull out, there's also houses that have driveways that come right onto that street and they don't have, they're pretty, it's pretty tight. Like there's not a whole lot of space. So basically once they start backing up, they're gonna go like almost immediately into the street. And I just, I've wondered how what it's like to, to try and navigate that the road with the with that curve coming and people kind of coming out of nowhere. So I guess the greater question would be, you know, is this a street where it makes sense to put bike lanes to narrow the road a little bit because we've got, you know, we've got, if we're moving five spaces already for one driveway, you know, if we take a closer look at this, are we gonna see like, hey, this whole street suffers from the same, or that whole like block suffers from the same problem around that curve. Um, and because we have a school there and we have, uh, you know, apartment buildings, um, the houses are actually, I think this kind of duplex situation where there's like, they're front and back. It's not all single family per se, I think along that area. So, you know, there there could be some justification for saying, okay, if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna take this step and put red curbs on this stretch, let's be consistent, right? Let's not have it be, let's not create a patchworky street where, you know, um, you know, and every time you have random parked cars, that also creates issues for for drivers and bicyclists as well. So, um, so yeah, that's the the sort of big picture kind of thing that I'm trying to say about that block. Um, Fu, did you, were you able to see, get the, um, the width? Yeah, it's 30, uh, right here, um, 37 feet. Oof, okay. so that is quite wide, right? I mean, that's well, what is it? So divided by two, that's what, 17, close to 17? Right? Oh, yeah. Right. So when, when a, a vehicle is parked, we typically would give about seven feet or so. So when, when you have cars parked on both sides, then you're looking at about uh, right. 10 right. to 11 foot per travel lane. Okay, so, but when there's not a whole lot of cars parked in there, which then, there is, uh, yeah, then you get, that's right. why, I think that's why you see these speeds is because people are like, I have this big wide open road and I'm just gonna power down it. Um, that's my guess. So okay. yes, if we, you know, if we're going to take away some parking, how many 
how many spots does that leave? Does it make sense to do it on one side of the street? I don't know. I mean, these are sort of street engineering questions, but you know, as a bicyclist and a, as a driver on that road, I definitely feel like a little uneasy going along that stretch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I suspect that there may be some uh, creative comments to consider and get feedback from staff on, but before we go down that road of getting more creative here, um, do, are there any uh, uh, questions or comments from members of the public? I am not seeing any hands, so if you are here to excellent. Um, so I see a hand from Randy Avalos. Thank you, commissioners. Um, Randy Avalos, uh, District 5. Live just down the street, and I walk this a lot. Um, so just a couple questions and maybe um, some comments. But you know, the first thing is uh, I'm a bit confused about you know, what we're using for road speed. Like there's the reality where late at night, people might be driving fast. Or during school hours, it's so jammed up with traffic that it's dancing. Um, it's a bit concerning that we're talking 25 miles an hour, but I thought we were going to go 15 miles an hour in the future around schools. So the fact that's coming from city staff and city staff doesn't know does concern me a little bit about how much thought is going to this, frankly. I, I know you guys put a lot of time in it, but that is concerning. Um, just to know about construction that was completed before the school started, um, and that's a rare thing. Most of the parking's actually from the school uh, for overflow parking, they don't have a lot of parking there. So I was wondering if they had any comments or outreach directly to the school other than mailers. Um, and then finally, um, well, two final things. Would it be possible to get this PowerPoint shared? It wasn't on the agenda. Um, and then also just a general concern about District 5 getting all the nice things. I know this is just paint, but it's really staff time and attention when it's other parts of the city that do need attention as well. So thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you very much. And um, I think there, there were two good questions in there um, that it would be good for staff to address. So, so can staff uh, recap what the policy is with regard to the speed limit um, on the street and how that relates to the school speed? Can staff uh, recap that answer? Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that's a very good question right there. Typically, when it comes to from a transportation standpoint, if a street has a posted speed, um, that's that's the speed that we use to to govern some of the the, uh, the policies and, and uh, design elements that we're looking into. So in this case, uh, Fu is using the 25 miles per hour as the design speed for the site distance uh, determination. Uh, the 15 miles per hour that uh, Mr. Avalos mentioned again that is going to be applicable when schools are, um, when there are kids around the, around the area. So typically you'll pick up or drop off your uh, recess, uh, midday recess, et cetera. Um, it's, it's, it's geared towards specifically those time periods. And um, the project that we are mentioning is one that is currently underway um, and, and will be, will be establishing school zones uh, for CUI. Uh, for the public and some of the private schools as well. So definitely be seeing more of those signs in the coming months or so. Um, so so that, that's the, that would be my answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, uh, thank you for, for clarifying that, that the signs are the 15 miles when children are present and then otherwise it reverts to 25. So then the um, other question was about whether there has been outreach to the school in addition to outreach to the residents. Right, so I believe we did send out a postcard to the school, uh, but we did not do individual outreach to the, to the school. So that's certainly a, a great comment. And then we can take that into consideration and reach out to the school out there. We, and we'll do that before we actually implement the project, assuming if it gets approved tonight. Okay, um, thank you very much. And uh, are there any other members of the public who would like to comment on this item? Okay, I am not 
seeing any hands and we'd like to bring this back to the commission for comments and eventual motion. Anybody have any comments on the previous discussion? I guess I'll Not go Katie. first. Um, I have mixed feelings about this. Um, I mean, I do think like we should have talked to the school. I do think that like, it's nice to know that a resident can call and get something to happen. <laughs> um, they're probably like city council members and, and uh, commissioners who wish they had that power. Um, but uh, I, I guess I, you know, I do feel that there are other areas of the city that probably merit more attention than this. That said, we've come this far. There seems to be a really solid legal rationale for changing this. It's almost like, you know, I imagine we have a whole bunch of places around the city that are not in compliance with the current code. And if this is what it took to get our attention to one of them, I mean, I, it's, I find I have a hard time saying, let's not do that. I mean, especially if it doesn't take a ton of time. Um, I guess I would just suggest that you do reach out to the school um, and give them a heads up. Um, and, uh, and I do think that, um, you know, I always appreciate, I, I know we have to balance sort of being responsive to the community with all of the other bigger picture items that, that we look at. Um, but, you know, I would love us to do a holistic look at, you know, I, where are the current crosswalks and driveways where visibility is bad and where we've had a higher incidence of accidents you know, if that's the thing that we're doing, let's do it systematically would be my recommendation. So I guess my second part of my thing is happy to vote on this tonight, but I would love staff to, to you know, proceed with strategy on the broader safety issue. Um, that would be um, Yes. Yeah. Um, so I wanna um, put that to staff about whether um, that seems like a reasonable thing to um, so somehow address. And um, is that something that staff can comment on now? Does staff need to like think about it and comment some more? You know, do you need the city council to say, uh, let us actually figure out whether there's any more proactive way of maintaining sight lines? Um, uh, how, what, what, is, uh, what, are, what are staff commentary about this? point uh, about the possibility of addressing this uh, any more systematically. Okay, great. Um, I see our assistant public works director is on board, so I'll let him go first. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so again, Hugh Louch, assistant public works director. So I, I think that, um, that we hear you and um, we agree that there, there could be additional um, focus on kind of a proactive safety planning uh, work that we could do um, and uh, supportive of that. Um, in terms of what it will take to make that happen, um, it, it does, everything takes resources, obviously. And, and so we need to prioritize that along with all the other things we do. We certainly, you know, you know one of the things maybe I would have just observe about this type of thing relative to like all the things we do there, you know, sort of very low cost basic signage and striping things like this that we do that we can do very quickly and, and cheaply and easily and so we're, we're going to do and we do do those all over town uh, as people request them or as we uncover them ourselves um, and then we move into things that become a little bit more you know require a little bit more planning a little bit more design work a little bit uh, you know more effort um, and so then as you move up that scale obviously it, it's it's more resources that we need um, but I think what I hear you all saying is that sort of in advance of that maybe a little bit more focus on um, you know a, a safety plan if you will uh, that, that we can then use to sort of prioritize things so I think it's good to get that feedback um, we certainly have elements of that, I would say, but uh, there are probably some more work that we could do to, to bring uh, some of that forward. And it's certainly something that we can, we can work on. I mean, one more mm -hmm. thought on that. I just, sorry to, sorry to cut you off, Adina. I feel like this is the kind of thing where commissioners could do an audit almost, you know, 
as we're going around town. It's, you know, I, I, I have this little mental running list. I, I, I miss the days when I could bike or drive around town and not see everything as a complete streets commissioner. <laughs> and like stop talking to the person next to me about, wow, that crosswalk is really badly obstructed. <laughs> but anyway, um, I mean, should we, could we, is it useful for us to, you know, this resident brought this to your attention. Like, could we, should we be compiling a running list of the things we see around town and, and sharing that so that you have like a bigger picture or is that not helpful because you already have too long a list yourselves? So I don't know if you, you, you're going to go, um, but but I would say, you know, certainly welcome a, a list. If, if you're, you know, ridden by, walking by, driving by area, if you see something of concern, definitely want to bring that to our attention. Um, I, I would say, you know, from from a you know, from a high level standpoint, obviously we we dedicate our time to some of the more you know, projects that have been going on for a while, uh, CIP projects that are going on, but we also dedicate a certain percentage of our time uh, from a staff level to address issues like this, um, you know, safety issues, um, et, et cetera. Um, you know, so because we, we, as, as um, you know, servants of the resident, we do get emails from, from residents uh, on, on all sorts of different issues. And we, we need to make sure that we prioritize them uh, based on, you know, obviously safety, comfort, um, et cetera. So, so we definitely also allocate some time to, to address those issues. Um, and, and so definitely welcome uh, any, any type of um, observations that you made that you felt like is safety related or is it a comfort related? I certainly welcome those and then we can, we can assess accordingly as well. Uh, but I do, I, I do want to at least recognize that, you know, we try our best to address some of these issues as they come up uh, in a more Unfortunately, in a more reactive way, but there are definitely ways that we can make it more proactive, like you was mentioning a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. thank, thank you. Um, Commissioner Seaburn has had a hand up. Um, I, it, it's been a while since the comment came up before, but I wanted to kind of side with, I think doing something is better than doing nothing. If like, as the issue has been highlighted to us and it's clear that there is a site like so i do think we should and it seems like it's red paint and some parking spaces so like those kind of problems i i also think because i'm like having visions of the last time we met on an issue that wasn't related to bike lanes but that always comes back to bike lanes like when a thing comes up i think it would be helpful especially like in terms of roadway width right like if the road is wide we're totally going to ask about bike lanes if they aren't there I'm a little bit surprised that for a middle school that the main road in front of their street doesn't have bike lanes hasn't come up before. Um, so that does surprise me. And I think it would be worth connecting with whoever does um, safe routes at La Entrada to consider like what would, um, uh, you know, what would it look like? So I think to the broader picture, like I support the move of removing some parking spaces. I really think given our, understanding of how cars like wide roads to go fast it would be worth putting some kind of helpful signage up when we remove those spaces to remind people that they still need to go slowly because there are children in a school there um so it might as we anticipate that some people might use that space to go faster um reminding them not to might be helpful and just looking at again always we're going to ask about bike lanes <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm going to put myself in the queue here and then um, uh, ask promotions. Um, so, like, is, is this a location where bike lanes would be? indicated um does it need a like is it in the tmp to put bike lanes here has there been a uh safe routes to school um thingamajig for lot entrada um uh so uh can can staff uh respond uh about the bike lanes in general and about like when's the last time lot entrada has had a safe route treatment 
Yeah, so our TMP currently identifies uh, sharing road to, to have class three, so bike route um, to be installed and not, not a bike lane. So if that's certainly, if that's the, the wish of the commission, um, obviously I, I think this hints at something uh, much bigger. Uh, if we want, want to go ahead and do a bike lane, obviously we'll need to do the proper outreach. Uh, we need to make sure that we study the um, the parking demand around the area as well. Um, and this really kind of leads to the to a, a point that I was making a little bit earlier in terms of you know, this becoming an idea and then being placed in the queue and then ultimately uh, being implemented, uh, evaluated and designed. And, and as many of you hinted a little bit earlier, we already have a long queue. So this will just be the back of the queue. Um, but I, I think in terms of uh, the the overall structure of the, the school and whether or not it's it had a safer study. My understanding is that this, this did have a safe route um, study. <clears throat> I know it's back in my back back before my time, uh, but not too far uh, ahead of too far back. So I, I would say maybe a study was done within the within the eight to eight to fifteen, maybe maybe the six to six to ten year range would be, would be my guess, but I know that this this school had a uh, safe route to school study before. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. And my uh, uh, final comment building on what other people, so I, I like, I, I think that since somebody has observed it and I'm, I'm glad that the city has a policy that if somebody observes the sight line hazard that the city comes out and fixes the safety hazard, so I will be happy supporting the immediate recommendation. Um, and I also um, uh, think that there's a point to the additional concern about being proactive. The city council uh, does have a vision zero uh, policy from a number of years ago and um, it, it, it does seem like a sensible thing to kind of weave into what staff does to be proactive, especially since there are um, some like parts of town and some populations that have more disposable time to observe safety issues and you know, call or write in to City Hall and other people who are like super busy who might not be able to, and then that would um, basically result in more safety improvements being done in places that people have more discretionary time and attention. And that is probably not what we want as a city. So with that editorial comment, um, uh, still like going ahead and, and making this improvement seems like a good idea to me. Does anybody have any motions? Uh, Commissioner Steven, do you have a hand to make a motion? Or some other reason? Are you muted? No, I just forgot to take my hand down. <laughs> but um, how do I? Oh, it's because. Okay. Okay, oh. All right. Uh, while, while you wrestle Zoom to the ground, does anybody else have a motion? Uh, I need motions because they always get too long. Um, I move that we accept the staff recommendation, um, but suggest that before they bring. Oh wait, they don't. This doesn't go to council, right? This is just us. Yeah. This is just uh, commission power. But I, I think you were going on, you were going with um, reaching out to the seat. Uh, I school. I feel like you should tell the school. Yeah. That, I don't know. Am I am I the only one who feels that way? Like I guess I just I I mean well, I've heard. I think that's a fair that's a fair assessment and a fair um, request to staff. Uh, we'll definitely reach out to the school about this. Um, and, if nothing, I'll just make sure they get the postcard and, and they don't have any additional comments and we can do so before we, we implement the project. Um, just really quickly, I was just thinking like if I were the school administrator. Hey, hang on, is there, is there, is there a second, second, oh, for the, second to the motion? Any second to the motion? Okay, uh, 
Uh, okay, now any comments on the topic, Commissioner Lee? So I just thought like, say, say um, you reach out, someone from Public Works reached out to the school and the mm -hmm. school says, oh, um, you know, those parking, we, we, we need a certain amount of parking and we really have this issue with cars not being able to see when they're coming out. Um, at that point, are you able to then also meet the school's request and say, we're gonna look out and see if the, the sight lines of whatever are okay for the school? Is that something that you would be able to do? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, okay. Again, uh, as much as um, we would like to be proactive about this type of stuff, uh, you know, just the, the, the nature of uh, the city is that there is just a lot of um, those type of inadequacy. So if it comes in, we'll definitely take the evaluation. Um, so we'll reach out to the school. Um, everyone will, there's also a 15-day uh, period for us to, to uh, make sure that no one wants to uh, appeal the decision before we actually implement that as well. So there's plenty of time for us to do the outreach and coordination before we actually uh, go in and put in the record. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so what I heard there is that this is a re outreach to the school about what they think about the parking removal and also what they think about the sight lines on their own driveway. Is that a correct interpretation of what the outreach to the school will include? Okay. Um, any more comments before we take a vote on the motion on the floor? All right, can staff help us out? Okay, great. Thank you very much. So we have a motion by Commissioner Bulusi and a second by Commissioner Sibrian. So for those commissioners that would like to uh, vote yes to this, if you can raise your hand and hold it up for a couple of seconds, that would be great. I see you know, hands. Great, thank you very much. Can, can I say one more thing um, on yeah. this topic before I forget it? Um, maybe it would be cool for us to, um, it might be a neat idea for staff to, to bake in reevaluating sight lines if you're doing into something like a standard repaving project. Like, cause I, cause I think I, I totally get that you can't do everything and there's certain routine things that you do, you know, at some point you're repaving middle, you re recently repaved middle and olive soon you're going to be doing Ravenswood, et cetera. I mean, is there a universe in which when you're doing this anyway, you're probably looking at the curb line um, and, and that that you could somehow incorporate that? I know that we can't really give you direction right now on that or ever unless you put it on our agenda, but I would just recommend maybe considering a policy like that. Yeah. I, you don't I think, already do it, and maybe you do. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we heard it loud and clear and, and recognizing that it's not agenda as item, but you do allow staff to, to talk about that offline and then I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to um, come up with something. If, if nothing else, we can bring it back to the commission in a future time for a discussion. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, so uh, 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 thank you very much to Fu for uh, presenting this item and incrementally improving the safety of our city. Um, we will now move on to the next item, which is uh, item number E3, which is to recommend the adoption of resolution number 2021-6, supporting the city's application for a uh, city county associated government, AKA CCAG Transportation Development Act Article 3 grant for a pedestrian and bicycle crossing improvement at Van Buren Road and Ringwood Avenue. And um, a staff will now introduce the item. Great, thank you. Uh, so cue that out again. Um, I will, I'll present this item and um, let me share my screen. Oh, I need approval as well, Kevin. There you go. You should Thank you. Okay, okay. So you should be able to see my slides, I hope. Yes, we can see them. Excellent. 
Uh, so thanks, commissioners, for the opportunity to present uh, this item. We're, we're into the acronym solid here with CKEG and TDA and one thing and another, uh, but hopefully we'll make this uh, reasonably simple um, and clear. Uh, what I hope to do is kind of give a little bit of background on what the grant opportunity is, um, walk you through what we're proposing to apply for and why, um, and then uh, recommend that you um, approve uh, this grant. We do need a letter or, or a resolution of approval uh, to go after this um, uh, grant. It's, it's one of the requirements. Uh, so hoping that you'll approve that tonight. So uh, the Transportation Development Act uh, funds quite a lot of things. Um, within Article 3 of that act, there's this funding source that is for projects that encourage and improve bicycling and walking conditions. Um, and it has two different types of projects that are eligible. There are planning projects, uh, if you're doing a citywide or countywide or other sort of full jurisdiction bicycle or pedestrian plan, you can apply for that. Um, that's not something that we're, we're pursuing right now. Or you can apply for capital projects. And you can see there's sort of a list of a handful of capital project types that we can apply for. So new infrastructure, which is what we'd be applying for. There's also a quick build opportunity. There's restriping. There's also maintenance. So there's a variety of things we could apply for. Um, there are a few requirements. I haven't listed them all. Um, quite a bit of information we have to put together, um, although most of it's stuff that we have on hand. Um, uh, but we do need to provide a 10% local match uh, for the project. Um, it does need, as I said, to be approved by um, a bicycle pedestrian advisory or equivalent committee. Um, and so we are, you here are the equivalent committee. It has to be consistent uh, with various Caltrans and, and MTC requirements because MTC is ultimately the administrator of the Article 3 funds. So uh, those are the, the things that are required. Um, and, and one thing that, and I should have put it on here and maybe it's on a later slide, but to be clear, we can only on the capital side pursue funding for um, the design phase and for the construction phase of work. So we can't actually lead sort of concept planning, for example, for a project out of this uh, funding source. We would have to have that complete. So it doesn't narrow the list of things that we um, can pursue. Uh, the, so this is sort of a Overview of the proposed uh, location uh, here, where we are, are, are talking about putting in a raised crosswalk. Um, this is the overcrossing uh, that exists today uh, over, uh, you know, sort of the Ringwood overcrossing uh, that's used by a lot of folks. Um, uh, it's a, an important route for us. You know, when I think about traveling, um, what we're going to call uh, east west, even though it's north south, uh, uh, through the city. Uh, you know, the, the major roads are can be kind of challenging for people walking and biking in particular. Um, and so this is sort of a route that we're doing a lot of work on. We've done a lot of work and we're doing a lot of work, I would say, to make improvements, to make uh, sort of an improved route. So you think about the Oak Grove project um, a little bit. There's the um, Coleman Ringwood study that we're going to be starting with the county um, in the new year that speaks to parts of this route. There's the Bellhaven traffic calming plan. There's the new crossing over uh, you know, Bayfront Expressway. There's just a whole bunch of pieces. There's the work on Chilco that's been done. And it sort of starts to string together what is um, sort of a, a middle of town, uh, you know, east-west route. Um, and so this uh, sort of creates a great opportunity, I think, to can make continued improvements to that um, as we look at making, uh, you know, building out sort of safer bicycle pedestrian networks. Um, as I mentioned, it's used uh, by students of several schools uh, that come back and forth across uh, in both directions uh, across the, uh, the, the bike ped bridge there. Um, it is an area where there's been a number of bicycle crashes, uh, you know, so, sort of a somewhat famous, uh, which I, uh, Kevin pointed out to me recently a uh, study that or, or story that suggested that's the most dangerous intersection in Menlo Park. And we aren't able to confirm all of the uh, numbers uh, that they have, but there are quite a few bicycle collisions in particular, uh, which makes some sense because bicyclists are coming down a ramp and turning off of that. So that does sort of present uh, what 
might be a potential risk uh, that we want to pursue. Um, and it's the other thing, as I mentioned, we do need to have, um, I guess I put it here, um, a project that's sort of ready uh, to move into that design and construction. Um, and we don't have a lot of things that would sort of fit this bill exactly. So, so we feel fortunate. Um, this project was designed, the concept design was developed as part of the Bellhaven traffic calming plan, but couldn't actually be funded uh, by that fund source because it didn't actually address the kind of cut through traffic issues that were the source uh, for that funding. Um, but it is something that we did get some preliminary planning and concept design work on. Uh, so that's good and allows us to move forward with it uh, for a grant source like this. Um, this is one of the two um, uh, uh, concept designs that we have uh, for the crossing. So it would add a crossing. So this is the existing crossing. It would add a new raised crossing uh, at this location uh, on the other side of, of um, Ringwood Avenue um, and uh, extend the path, which ends here. Um, and I realize uh, it might be hard to tell from the concept designs what the difference is. Uh, so I'm gonna show you two examples. Uh, so this is uh, one that you'll be probably very familiar with on Laurel Street, uh, right in front of uh, City Hall. Um, and as you can see, this, the, the crossing here uh, has, it kind of dips back down and, and you can see sort of a standard or somewhat standard curb ramp. Uh, and so the, the water uh, flows normally sort of through uh, on either side um, of the, of the uh, raised crossing. Um, and then here's an example from a street in San Francisco on Steiner Street. Um, and in this one, you can see the crossing is straight across uh, and there's no sort of uh, up and down movement. So you kind of go straight all the way across uh, um, the street like that. So this is, uh, you know, uh, has some advantages. Um, the big disadvantage is that is the sort of drainage issue. And if you've worked in transportation a while, you know that all good transportation ideas become drainage projects. Um, and that, that can be a little bit uh, unfortunate because that adds a variety of costs associated with it. And you can see, in fact, so there's some drainage inlets here uh, that are necessary to help water travel. Um, and there probably are ones that we might not be able to see on the far side of it as well, unless it's the roads graded the other way. So got to deal with the water. That's always one of the critical things we have to work with. So a um, couple options there. That's the kind of thing that as we got into final design, uh, we, would, we would work further on and, and uh, specify um, based on, on what we learned uh, from, from surveys and other things like that. Um, and with that, yeah, we basically are looking for uh, your approval um, that we pursue this grant funding source. Um, and uh, that's all I have. I'm happy to talk through any of the details um, and entertain any questions you have. All right, uh, thank you very much. And I uh, wanna start with questions from members of the commission. Um, and then we'll take questions and comments from members of the public. Um, Commissioner Lee. Hey, so I'm glad to see this uh, particular intersection getting some attention. Um, I know that uh, as the commission had talked about uh, when that study came out or the news report went from the law firm came out, we talked about like what other various options for this particular intersection and noted that there was a stop sign on the other side of the um, bike bridge, but not on this side. And what would it make sense to put a, a stop sign there in order to maybe alleviate some of the um, potential for collisions here? Um, and Kevin, I believe you looked into this, right? Right, yep. So um, definitely from a staff level, we have looked into this uh, two times, in, at least in, in my tenure, with my tenure with the city. And uh, the purpose of essentially, when we, whenever we want to look into installing a stop sign, we would conduct what is called a always stop analysis. So it's a warning analysis that look at volume, both from vehicle, pet, bike perspective, also collision, and then a, a essentially a combination of one, two, three, would then sig signify whether or not a, a stop sign is warranted. So it's a, a very brief story of uh, what a warrant is. So in this case, we did two separate warrants. Uh, one was back in, I believe, 2015, and then we did another one 
in 2018 or so. Uh, unfortunately, because of the location of the intersection, uh, it did not, uh, both times they did not meet the warrant. Uh, and then we look, look, look at it both from the volume perspective, uh, also from, from the collision perspective as well. Mm. So there's not a way to say like uh, anticipatory, like if there's gonna be more people using this bike bridge in the future, you know, how far are we off the warrant, I guess, or the, right? Like, is it a huge gap? Is it enough to say like, hey, we anticipate more traffic coming through here? Uh, yeah, we, we, we did look at it briefly uh, with the anticipation that I mean, this was back in 2018 with uh, the Tire Academy, with some of the developments that we were anticipating. So we did increase the volume. Uh, however, that, that still did not trigger uh, a need for a warrant. And, and typically when it comes to, uh, the, uh, again, one, one of the main concerns with installing a stop sign when a <clears throat> when the warrant is not there is that uh, over time there there will be some concern about you know, the regular users of essentially kind of knowing the lay of the land and starting to ignore uh, the stop sign and, and thus kind of creating a false safety um, sense of safety for the for the bicyclists or the pedestrians that are crossing crossing the um, the crosswalk. So that, that's our main concern when it comes to putting a stop sign at a location where it's not warranted. Okay, and, and just Hugh, just so that I understand the main, the idea of having a raised crosswalk there is to, um, is so that cars that are coming along will instinctively be like, I gotta slow down because there's a change in the grade, is that right? Yeah, I mean, much like a speed hump, a raised crosswalk, uh, because it requires, um, uh, a change in grade for the vehicle you kind of come up and go back down um, it, it has a it reduces speed and it's been shown to effectively reduce speed uh, of vehicles traveling through there um, and also sort of make them more aware of their surroundings um, I think so to see the the things that are are taking place um, and, and I would just emphasize if I if I may really quickly that I think the last point Kevin was making which is that you know um, we can put whether we put a stop sign or not, like I would worry a little bit about in an area where most of the time there isn't very much traffic and people might not so stop all the way um, and get in the habit of not doing that, even with us today. At first it would probably produce some changes, but then over time, you know, um, the conditions might, might really create an issue where we'd be concerned about it, it actually sort of degrading the effectiveness potentially. So, so that would be the concern um, uh, with that. And, and, I, and I, would, I think I would wanna see us do additional traffic calming uh, of some kind, given the, the sort of geometry of that uh, intersection there and the way people travel through it regardless. Mm -hmm. So the main difference between the one and option one and two is that one is at, um, at grade level and requires extra drainage attention, and the other one would dip down a little bit to to allow not normal drainage. Precisely. And, got it. And th the idea is that everybody would be coming through the one opening. Like there wouldn't be separate. Um, like you would. Ex the reason for extending it further is to um, to make sure that the um, the eastbound lane or the eastbound traffic or bicyclists would just or pedestrians would just go straight across is that why like it, it's weird that the i mean i'm trying to i'm maybe i've just navigated this without thinking so after so many years but i don't remember the crosswalk being on the far side it is on the far side right now uh do okay. you, you mind maybe just uh sharing the screen again and maybe we have yeah let me do that um so yes. i make sure yeah, i do want to understand um what you mean by far side? <laughs> well, and so I, I didn't realize you had to sort of cross over the street to the wrong side of the street in order to get over the crosswalk. I think I've just been using it for so long that I've forgotten that that actually happens. And that's sort of weird that that's how it works right now. So the crossing moves up this, like if you can see my mouse, it goes right. sort of away from there and, and that, that. Right, but the crosswalk is sort of on the, on the wrong side when you're going right now. Like if Wait, you if you're to... coming from this direction, Okay, that's, yeah, that's so weird that I've never noticed that. I think and we wouldn't necessarily be recommending closing off this, um, although we could discuss that um, oh, as much okay. as providing a secondary um, option in a traffic calming device. Got it, got it. And so I, I know that um, Bill, Bill Kirsch and um, John Weiner have brought up this idea of having a, a raised uh, intersection. 
So is that something that you entertained at all when you were, or, or the, the team who, uh, that created this conceptual design entertained at all? We, we haven't looked at designing a raised intersection at this location. Um, and um, it wasn't something that we asked them to do. And there are really maybe two or three different reasons for that. Um, one of which is that um, raised intersections are quite complicated to construct effectively. Um, and as much as they're, they have a, you know, it's a really nice idea the effective, like being able to pull it off effectively is hard. Um, and because of the drainage issues and because of other issues, um, and I've seen a couple of cases where raised intersections have no rays. Um, and if you have no rays, you don't get the value of, a, of the kind of traffic calming that you're looking for. It's much easier for us to achieve the sort of up and down rays movement with a crosswalk than it is with a raised intersection um, once we kind of get into the kind of complexities of, um, of uh, you know, drainage design. Uh, which, as I mentioned, uh, kind of rules all. Um, so, so that's that's one thing that I, I, I would have some concerns about, and we'd, have, you know, I'm not saying it's impossible, and we could look into it um, and determine if, it, if in fact, uh, we could get uh, what we were trying to get. Um, but um, it is something I have concerns about. Uh, the second thing is that it would turn this from a sort of reasonable cost project into a very expensive project, relatively speaking. Um, and I don't know that it would produce more of the benefit that we're looking for. And so it also has the potential then to reduce our likelihood of getting the grant. Uh, and so that'd be another um, kind of uh, concern that I would, um, I would have for this. So um, between those two things, um, while I, I love the idea of raised intersections, I guess the last thing I would say is that this, this gets a lot of use at some particular times of day and, and, and throughout the day as well, but there are really some sort of focused times where it's getting used. The places where raised where you see raised intersections are, and the, the logic for them is typically where you have a lot of pedestrians traveling in, a, in every different direction in a way. And so you're kind of creating this, you're, the idea of a race intersection is to create this space where everybody is sharing the space all at once. And it's just sort of different and, and new. But this is a place where there's gonna be some focused times of day where there's gonna be a lot of people traveling through it. And then it's gonna be, you know, one here, one there kind of. Um, and so I'm not sure that this would be the place where you would sort of try your, your first rate, we would try our first race intersection, but um, again, not opposed to the idea. I think race intersections are great um, and, and certainly something that we could think about uh, potentially in other locations. Um, but as I mentioned, there are a lot of complexities um, with that. And as I said that a bunch of people raised their hands, so I know there's gonna be <laughs> some interesting conversation about that. Got it, I'm gonna let, uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, thought process. I'm gonna turn it over to my fellow commissioners for their questions. You're welcome. Yeah, so Commissioner Baruzzi is at hand. Um, I'm actually going to hold off for now. I come go to other people first. Okay, uh, Commissioner Shubian. Um. Um, okay, so uh, I understand the thing about the raised intersection. I have a couple of questions and I feel like I should know this because I traverse it every day. <laughs> um, are there already signs approaching the crosswalks to tell drivers that they're that they have to stop for pedestrians and like are there already is there already signage like that i know that there is signage um out there that indicates that there is a crossing um and we we'd i'd have to check and make sure and, and kevin i don't know if you know off the top of your head what the precise signs that are used there because there are a couple of different ones you can that okay. use so yeah. but there are there is some signage indicating that it is a pedestrian crossing okay i know i've seen the one telling me that cross traffic doesn't stop so i was just curious if there was another one to tell the cross traffic they should stop um and go ahead Good. no no yeah so there, there's nothing that says for example um i'm trying to think if we have a yield of pedestrians in crosswalk type sign so and i don't think that we do i think we just have a like stand i i think but again like I've been through there now a bunch of times and and you, you forget what's there so um, i'd want to confirm but i believe what is there is just the 
sort of standard pedestrian warning sign. It's the yellow sign that you have, the tr the, the yellow uh, diamond yeah, that says, person. That show, yeah, that's on either side of the crosswalk. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, the couple of pieces of feedback. So I get why the race intersection is complicated and might get in the way of getting the grant. And I definitely think we should do something with this intersection. Um, I do wonder, one of the design things I liked about that was that it kind of opened up that whole section. So rather than like two exits from the bike lane, it looked to me like that whole section was open, which then made me ponder, like maybe you can't make a raised intersection, but can you just paint that entire square something that says like hey bikes and people are here like that this is a place that people travel and then between both crosswalks the whole of it is painted and like that is what draws attention to it and then and then i don't really care how you do the raised crosswalk like either option seems fine to me but i think having getting rid of the one entrance i don't I don't like that idea because it then forces the bikes to do this extra like weird wriggle wiggle thing every single time you want to get on and off whereas right now it's fairly straight um i do see that there are like sight line issues like i have to come to almost a full stop before i enter the road before i can know that there aren't cars coming so when approaching that street like you really do have to nearly stop to know whether there are cars coming or not sometimes and that I can see that um, more less risk averse people might not be so uh, slowy there. Um, anyway, so that is my feedback is just like all the warning signs. I get hot, the lights aren't very effective because I don't want to stop and press the light. Like who's going to do that? And so I can see that that's not super effective because it's the bikes that I'm betting the most of the things are happening between bikes and cars because they come off fast. Um, and so just some, like all the alerts. Anyway, that's my feedback. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Commissioner Bruzzi. Um, I keep remembering that everything I have to say is a comment and not a question. I, I do think that, well, I will say that, um, so an hour before the meeting, I emailed uh, Kevin about, um, I can't remember if it was speeds or traffic. I think it was traffic, about average traffic on Van Buren and on Pierce and on Ringwood. And he was able to get me two out of three, which is great. Um, but he didn't have it for Van Buren. And, and I feel like Van Buren's been just sort of like, I haven't seen it in our speed studies. I haven't seen it. It's like, it's not, it's like this road that time forgot. Um, and, uh, but obviously if you're looking at a warrant, you're probably at some point assessing how many cars are coming through there. Uh, and, um, I guess I'd love to have that information for a project like this because it helps us frame, you know, what the what the challenges are a little bit better. But I mostly just have comments and things to say. So I'll let other people. We probably should go to public comment if other people don't have questions. Yeah. So I have a question in in staff before we go to public comment, and um, that has to do with the. Um, the amount of judgment that goes into a warrant with regard to particular situations. And I want to elevate what Commissioner Sebrian said in terms of the usage pattern of this uh, ramp and route, because this is really heavily used by teenagers who are coming to and from the school and then to um, like other, there's like a boys and girls club on the other side of this. And so while an adult comes down that ramp and like, you know, comes to almost a complete stop and looks both ways, what you see when you come in, uh, you know, school hours when, uh, you know, or, 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 after, or after school activity hours, whatever, when, when um, you know, teens and young people are traversing this, they're coming down the ramp and they turn and they just barrel across and they're not looking because of, you know, that's just not something that their experience and brain maturity is doing fully yet. And so in terms of the sight line for drivers, a driver who is, um, you know, uh, uh, coming up from, uh, uh, Redwood City 
direction is not going to be expecting someone like barreling across there as people so often, as young people so often do. And because this is not such a heavily trafficked area, um, um, it like in, unless there is even more, um, uh, you know, like vis visual indication, a driver would likely be surprised by the behavior of the young teenagers that are coming across there. And so I'm wondering if there is any room for judgment in terms of the warrant or whether it always has to do with like how many people have died there yet or collisions that have happened there yet. It's not going to hit it by the amount of traffic and to wait for it to hit by the number of the collisions seems kind of m macabre given what we know about this. So is there judgment on this? So, so um, I mean, the short answer I think is that yes, uh, there's a, a certain amount of judgment that we can exercise um, with these uh, sort of stop warrants um, in particular. Um, and there are, are, are times that we can say, yes, we want to put a stop sign in um, anyway. Um, I, I guess my feeling is, in a, and I was trying to say this before, is that even if we were to contemplate sort of putting it in despite not meeting warrant, I still feel like a project like this is actually important, um, uh, you know, because I, I think that I'm not convinced that the stop sign alone is going to solve the issue that we see. Um, and so so that's why I think this is valuable regardless, but but on the stop sign issue, particularly, um, there are times when we can uh, make an exception to a warrant. It, it, like all things uh, that we do, um, if we are following the rules, you know, then we are covered. Uh, and if we are not following the rules, then there can be other issues. But um, as long as we sort of have a logic and a justification and a, and a reasoning for it, we, we can take exceptions to those. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all right. And I, I'll have more comments on this later. I'm like not usually a big fan of excess stop signs. And I will just hold that until we get to the comments. Um, are there any uh, other commissioner comments before we take this to members of the public. Um, all right, are there any members of the public who have comments to make on this item? Um, uh, uh, Bill, uh, Bill, Bill Kirsch, are you muted? Uh, am I muted now? No, you, we can hear you. Okay, commissioners, thank you for your work. And uh, city staff, thank you for uh, paying attention to this uh, very dangerous intersection. I think that regarding the warrant, uh, this, is, this intersection is rated the most dangerous for bicyclists in the whole county, not just the city. And so if Van Buren doesn't get much traffic, and we've had eight crashes here in the last five years or so, I can't imagine that we can't get a warrant to put a stop sign in. But aside from that, uh, this, th the problem here is cyclists getting hit by cars. And this design does not solve that problem. And as Adina was just saying, if, if kids are heading to MA or the others, uh, if they're heading to MA, they're gonna come down and they're, they're not gonna go across this crosswalk. We know that. They're just gonna shoot across and they're going to be unprotected as they are now. So this is not, in my view, and John Weiner's view, we sent the letter in. Uh, this is not going to help that situation. And those cyclists are not going to make a very, coming off that ramp, make a very sharp right-hand turn, go across the sidewalk, and then have to cross over again on Ringwood, uh, having to look out for three directions of traffic to continue westbound. They're not going to do that. They're going to go straight across. They'll be unprotected, and this will not help them. So that's why we propose the NACTO standard design. If that's something that's not workable, or you don't have, to, don't have the budget for, or we don't have time to get a grant for, perhaps 
we can have uh, the walk ramp there and another that can, uh, you know, come where the cyclists would normally come off of. Uh, and or we can have uh, speed humps or something on either side of this intersection on Van Buren, something to slow cars down in advance. But this is, an in, in my view and John's view, of an inadequate design that is not going to solve the problem. And if we're going to take the time to do something, let's do it right. Even if we miss the opportunity for a grant, let's get this right and do something that's going to save lives and, and, and stop folks from getting hurt, crashed by cars coming off this bridge. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, thank you, Bill. And I want to um, uh, open this up to comments from fellow commissioners and we'll take privilege for about 10 seconds because this has come up twice before and I suspect that I was behind at least some of that both of the times because when the bridge went in there was a safety problem and then like a year later when it was checked again there was a safety problem and we still have a safety problem so I um, uh, will uh, take comments from fellow commissioners. Um, Commissioner Bruzzi. Okay, I have notes because there was a lot I wanted to say. Um, so I went and looked at the accident data for this. And first of all, I have to say that lost that that that, that survey thing that said the most dangerous intersections, yada yada yada. Um, if you're using like a Bayesian theory, like the reason these these intersections have a lot of bike accidents is because they have a lot of bikes, right? And so I don't know if they're more dangerous than other intersections relative to the number of bikes they have. But I will say that the indication of a lot of bikes and a lot of bike crashes to me means that if anything, we should make it safer for bikes. So I looked at the accident data that, that from the state database from between 2009 and the end of 2020. And of course, there are other accidents that have happened that aren't in that database. Um, but four out of the five, so they were all bike crashes. There were no pedestrian crashes. Um, they were all of the same nature, which is to say bikes crossing Van Buren and getting hit by cars because um, the cars aren't stopping. Um, and four out of five, the cars were heading south. And I don't think it fully, I don't think it fully hit me until Bill was just talking that the raised crosswalk on one side of the intersection is only going to, like it doesn't do anything for the, for the bikes coming off the bridge and the cars coming toward them heading south like they don't get that stopping at the at the bump right like that's not gonna <laughs> the, there's no raised intersection on that leg um and i don't know why the southbound drivers were more common i mean four out of five is not maybe statistically significant but i just to me that feels like again um sure let's make raised crosswalks here but i want to solve i want to make sure that if we're addressing this intersection that we're addressing the right problem um, the thing that I was, um, poor Kevin, talking to him about already before before the meeting even started, um, was that warrant or not, on the other side of the spike bridge, there is an always stop for everybody except bikes coming off and the off of the the bike bridge, and that stop sign probably wouldn't be warranted today based on the amount of traffic that goes through that intersection, but curiously there are no recorded bike crashes or car crashes either in that. You know, in the same database, on one side you have five, on the other you have zero. Um, the average daily traffic on on Pierce, which is the analog to Van Buren on the other side of 101, is like 500 or something. It's not very many. Um, and so, to me, it just seems like I, I get that staff have to be careful um, and warrants and yada yada yada. Um, but I know multiple council members, multiple current sitting council members, have expressed a desire to see. Uh, us fix this intersection for bikes. And, you know, I'm hoping that they can use their discretion as council um, to, to at least achieve symmetry here. Um, and I hear your concerns, um, Mr. Louch, uh, about the idea that, you know, cars might not stop, um, but that doesn't, again, seem to be a problem on the other side. And people are definitely used to it on the other side. And we've had complaints from people living on Pierce about, all kinds of sort of drag racing, speeding, et cetera, et cetera, happening. I think it tends to happen more at night than it does during the times of peak 
um, bike crossing. Uh, I guess I would say I, I see more reasons to add stop signs than I see not to add stop signs. Um, I like the additional treatments that make cars say, hello, what's happening here? Um, but I feel concerned about the fact that we're only addressing one leg of the intersection and that the that the, the bikes, the, the, the big concern I think is for me is the, the one bikes coming, coming or coming off the bridge, um, that there are visibility issues. Um, and then the other thing I would say is I do like um, in both the design, the sort of design that, that um, former commissioners Weiner and Kirsch were presenting and also in this new design that you're proposing, I love that you're opening up um, the access, that, that you're making it, you're trying to make it more of a four leg intersection instead of this weird thing that it is right now. I think that's great. Um, but I, I, I hope that we can, and I also know you're running out of time. Um, so I don't know what you have time to do uh, but is there a reason not to raise both crosswalks uh, at the very least? And I get that we can talk about the stop sign with council at a separate time that like doing one doesn't preclude doing the other. That's what I got. I had a question after all. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, uh, Commissioner Seabrin. Okay, well, mostly a lot of what Katie just said. Um, I definitely like, um, I have often pondered this thing with the stop sign on one side and not the other. And I will say 100%, I definitely feel safer exiting the Bellhaven side of that bridge than I do the other side of Menlo Park every day, all the time, because those cars always stop and I don't have to. And I think the fact that you don't have to on one side and you do have to on the other, like that's part of the problem. And so as long as there are, like if there's a four-way stop on one side and not the other, it just creates unpredictability for um, inexperienced bike riders. And we're about to add about a zillion and a half houses on the other side of town who presumably will want to ride their bikes to other places in town at times outside of typical commute hours right now. So I would also suggest that we will potentially be getting an uptick in people just living their lives, riding their bikes to places and not only inside of school hours and that even though generally speaking, I feel like there's more cars in the Pierce Road area than there are on Van Buren. It's just the Van Buren traffic, like you just can't see them. And there's no stop signs on that road. So there is nothing to keep them from going at some pretty healthy speeds. There's no stop signs and there's not a lot of cross traffic over there. It's just a freeway wall. So I feel like there is, there's a lot of enticement for speed over there and not a lot of traffic to make them ever really go slow. Anyway, so I would be in favor of stop signs. Um, that would be my first solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, uh, hang on, does anybody other than me have? Yeah, um, so um, um, I would, um, so in, um, so, so are, are there some additional treatments that could be done to improve the visibility for the drivers, especially in like it's 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 terrible to see that the data is showing the safety hazard that was apparent when the bridge went in. But it's good to see that like, well, yes, the data is bearing out what one might have worried about when the bridge went in um, and. The, the, the drivers who are coming towards Palo Alto have a straight shot, no reason to slow down and and may not be expecting people like the, uh, people with immature brains coming downhill and across. Um, is there anything that can be done to increase the visibility such or, or any other things to help the drivers that are heading in the Palo Alto direction to slow down. So um, we definitely can think about treatments on both sides uh, of the crossing. Uh, that's certainly something that could be part of either directly part of this grant request or depending what that other treatment uh, was something that 
could be added on um, if it was say a speed hump instead of a raised crossing which would be a little bit lower cost for example so we could definitely think about speed reduction i think because a couple of you have asked about that should we consider speed reduction method measures on both sides that's certainly something that we can uh that we could uh, do and we could even try although um commissioner Bruzzi, you are correct we don't have a lot of time uh, and so our ability essentially we we can ask for a certain amount of money um and uh we need to have you know things sort of roughly in place to do that and, and we're we're basically right there uh, but but there may be a little bit of flexibility where we could ask for a little bit more if we we might do a little work on our end on friday basically but yeah mm -hmm. okay um and um then I'm going to ask another question and do a hopefully micro rant and then um, ask for, start to get, get recommendations. Um, when was the, like, has there been a Safe Rock to School study um, in this area, um, like relating to MA, relating to I, I don't think that there has been for tides and there's some other schools here as well. Um, when was the, has there ever been or when was the last Safe Routes to School study for the area? So Kevin, I'm gonna look at you if you can um, with the, the greater uh, length of history to, to know if, if this has been addressed in a particular Safe Routes planning effort previously. Yeah. So. I know I, I don't believe we have a an official safe route to school study for Belhaven. I'm less confident about MA. Um, although I think for Belhaven School area, I know that um, Nick, Nick E, our um, TDM um, coordinator, as well as collaboration with the county, have done a couple walk audits for the Belhaven Elementary School. Um, and definitely have developed uh, safe after school maps for all the schools citywide. So this would include MA as well as Barhaven Elementary School. Um, so those would be kind of the more recent effort that have been completed in the past two to three years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe if okay. I can just add one thing there, the, the, the other thing that I think is critical, if you look at all of the safe after school maps that we have, all the schools in this area include do include the overcrossing, and I think several of you mentioned this, and, and I've certainly been out there and observed it, as have other staff. This is heavily used by students to get to and from a variety of schools. Um, um, so MA may be the biggest one, but Tide Academy also. Um, I definitely saw kids that I would put as elementary school students judging against my middle and high schoolers. So um, there, there are definitely a lot of different kids using um, the area. Mm hmm Okay. And the comment slash micro rant is like, 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 I, I, like, I'm not generally a fan of excess stop signs. And it's often the case that like, like an ordinary lay person resident who sees a speeding problem and is like, hey, just plunk a stop sign in the middle of the street, that'll solve the problem. And then like, one has like served time on a commission and learned how that no is probably not going to solve the problem. Um, but in this case, I feel pretty strongly differently because of the particular characteristics of this intersection um, where there are young people crossing, coming down a hill and um like like we just like th th there's going to be an expectation that people are going to come be coming across that thing too fast co compounded by the fact that uh drivers are heading in the palo alto direction too fast because of the way that the street design and kind of cavern with no other signals um gets people to slow down so i would like to see both things that are increasing the, the um, you know, perceived obstruction for a driver, like even more than what they are here, plus a stop sign 
because it was seemed obvious that there was a problem coming and then the problem has come. So that is my mini rant. Um, does anybody have any uh, mo uh, recommendations and motions? Just to play a counter argument for a second, and I, I, I think I already know the answer to this, but just to throw it out there, uh, would it be worth considering a speed check on the bicycles coming down the ramp so that they don't hit that corner with speed and they're forced to stop, navigate through something, and that gives them time to see, to not carry their momentum out in front of the car? I But I also defer to the adolescent underdeveloped brain is probably going to do it anyway. So one thing I might note there um, uh, is that in terms of the ability to influence the behavior of people coming down the ramp, we don't have a lot of space to really work with uh, as far as that's concerned. So it's not like we can give them a longer runway um you know the, the the structure is what it is um so unfortunately uh commissioner so just really quickly um to respond to john too um palo alto has like a bunch of obstacles and those are just terrible if you were trying to lug a bike trailer or a stroller over those things like i think palo alto has taken out a bunch of those just because you know they're just so awful like we used to have to lift our bike trailer over one. It was really, really pain. So um, you, you do want it uh, Embarcadero and uh, it was, I, 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 I'm not, you know, actually really advocating for that. I just wanted to like sort of explore that side of the space. You know, right, like, right. Yeah, no, I thought of that. Actually, I was thinking about that right before you said that and kind of gone through that myself in my head, like, yeah. oh, you know, we're, we're thinking, what, what, what else can we do to yeah. make it safer, right? Um, point that we were at, we're at a runway, you know, it's like if there, if there was additional runway, once you got down and like the bicycles had to go parallel to the street for 100 feet, so that there'd be time to sort of establish themselves as like on the street before they were allowed to turn. I don't really know how you do that. But um, anyway, um, I was going to I was going to um, run. So um, Hugh, you've already you said that that it's possible to um, possibly do some work on the other side of the intersection to also reduce speeds. Um, I'd be curious to know whether like also like sort of even if you can't do a raised cross a cross wait raised intersection, what you thought of the idea of like doing some sort of surface paint or treatment to make it look like a large distinctive area. I thought Jackie's idea was really clever because I do think you know, visually having, I mean, again, anything to sort of create some visual break so that cars that are, you know, zooming down that long stretch of Van Buren are like, what's that, right? Or like, I'm just um, subconsciously made aware that there is a, there is a new area there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so there are a variety of, um, that's an interesting idea. And there's certainly a um, variety of treatments that folks, uh, you know, like us use to, to try to highlight differences in areas. So they're sort of like stamped asphalt and stamped concrete treatments that you sometimes see used um, in those situations. Um, uh, Palo Alto uh, has done a bunch recently um, where they, they do have that. And, and so it gives it a different kind of look um, and feel, even if it's not raised. So that's something we could look into, certainly. Um, the typical time we would do something like that would be more likely on a resurfacing uh, project um, uh, and less likely on a, uh, you know, a, a smaller installation. It, it sort of depends how much of the street we need to, uh, to dig up to build this thing. Um, and to put it in uh, sort of simple terms. So it's something we can look into um, and, and see if that's something that, that would make sense and, and be um, kind of affordable. One of the problems with stuff like that is that it is sometimes hard to get money uh, in grants for things, for items that are not necessarily considered, um, that might be considered aesthetic. Um, so that can be a challenge as well uh, for some of those things, even if, even if we believe that they might have a, a sort of safety benefit to them. So some of we can look mm -hmm. into, uh, for something like that, I don't know that we would have a cost estimate at this stage. Um, so we'd have to think about how well that 
that fits within maybe the kind of overall um, overall grant uh, application that we're we're pursuing here. Um, and, and just to be clear, you know the the grant itself sort of enables us to do some work, but it doesn't like limit the scope of work we can do. There's always an opportunity if we determine we want to do more things, you know, we, we can try to expand what we're looking for now, but while staying within a range of what we think will be um, approved. And of course, it'll depend on who else applies, et cetera, et cetera. But um, we can later on expand the scope of a project, you know, if directed by city council. So if uh, for some reason we were only able to get a certain amount of money for what, for part of this, but you know, the commission felt very strongly you wanted us to do more, we could always then seek to augment that um, at the and it'll take us six months to a, you know, a year to get the actual money here, um, as you know, as these things go. So this, there are options to, to also expand, even if we can't do this specific grant. Can I ask, I'll just, oh, sorry, Katie, can I just add one more quick thing? Is that okay? Um, so I was curious to know whether the what you're asking for us as a commission tonight is to really um, weigh in versus one you know one slightly different raised crosswalk versus another, or did staff just feel like you had to give us something to like <laughs> decide upon because I'm not sure that um, you know that there seems like to be a sort of substantial difference between the two, and I would think that you'd want to be use do the one that was easiest to maintain. For sure. Yeah, we are not deciding tonight which version of a raised crosswalk we would okay. be or what its final design would be, um, or even necessarily which side of the intersection it would have to be on. There, There is yet sort of the option to consider um, a final design that shifted it if you know that's kind of what we decided. And we would be able to do further kind of discussion and, and as we moved into that final design phase, you know, we don't want the option to be so vast that, you know, again, they have to sort of stay within the, the kind of cost envelope we're talking about, but we do have um, options uh, still that we can, we can decide, and that's not really what we're looking for. All we're looking for today is our complete sheet submission saying, yes, we want to pursue this grant for this, this sort of general improvement uh, at, at this location, and then that's, that's really the the kind of extent of it. And then we will, as we get into final design, we can absolutely bring that back, which we would do anyway, but um, that certainly um, will do in this case. I was okay. gonna ask how you determined which leg of the intersection to put the raised crosswalk on. And, and if it was just like the default, it's like, well, one leg doesn't have a crosswalk, let's make that the fancy one. Um, but I'm relieved to hear you say that you can do more analysis and maybe flip it. <laughs> like that the grant's not gonna have like, this the fancy crosswalk on one side and the other one on the other side if it turns out that you know that other leg turns out to be a little the trickier one yeah part of the reasoning in the short term we actually have it through the process looked at both both legs and the the drainage looks to be more complicated on the other leg and so you know i think that was part of the reason why we we started thinking about um this leg but um, you know, take it as a really good point that if we're worried about southbound vehicles and uh, bicyclists coming down the ramp, um, you know, we'll want to take a close look and make sure that that's the right treatment and or think about whether or not there are treatments on both sides. Um, and it might, yeah, so th th those are definitely things that we'll want to look at and make, uh, make sure we feel really good about before we implement anything. I would also be remiss if I didn't say um, that when I was looking at the other side, and again, like parity, right? Um, I did notice that like, um, that we don't have full legs of crosswalks on that intersection on the Belhaven side and that we have the same funky, it dumps into one, you know, one intersection thing there that we have on our side. And when I say our side, it's all Menlo Park side. I literally live a block from this. So that's like, that's my mental orientation here. <laughs> um, but I guess I hope that as we're planning for, um, you know, if I lived on Pierce instead of Van Buren and I saw people getting nice fancy crosswalks on the Van Buren side and not on the Pierce side, I might feel kind of bad. So I hope that as a city, we can like, you know, even it out eventually, even if it doesn't all happen in the same grant. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the question I have, I, I hear what uh, staff is saying in that, um, uh, road treatments 
may or may not fit into the grant and might fit better into a repaving project that will eventually happen. Um, if it doesn't, are there some things that the staff can do with um, kind of ostentatious paint to help, you know, like, you know, maybe like an, an, an optical illusion that looks like you have a waterfall. I'm, I'm joking, but like things with ostentatious paint that can help call attention to drivers that would otherwise zone out because of what the street encourages them to do. Yeah, I mean, we can, there are definitely things like that that we can look into. Um, there are, there are, believe it or not, rules on, on what we can paint on the road. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there are some restrictions um, to that. And, and you, you'll have seen, I'm sure all of you at times, you know, between the crosswalk lines, there are more options. Uh, then if you start to get outside of them and if you start to get outside of them, you run into issues um, that, that, you know, uh, of kind of compliance with the rules uh, that we have to follow between, but there has been sort of precedent set that within certain crosswalk, uh, within crosswalk lines, you have some options to do more uh, creative and colorful um, designs and, and folks have done that in a variety of places. So those are certainly the kinds of things we can look at. That's why I sort of suggested the kind of stamped asphalt out in the, intersection area because that's a thing that we could do because it's it's a texture and it's a um you know somewhat of a visual difference but it's also but it's not something that would run afoul of any kind of requirements so um yeah so those are some of the options and we can certainly look fully at the kind of range of signs uh that that we would use um and you know there are a variety of other markings you know sort of yield markings and other things um depending what happens uh at the location so Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Cibrian, and does anybody have a motion? And if not, I will. So, Commissioner Cibrian. Okay. Uh, my last comment is mostly like just to put on the wish list. Like someday, when the technology's there, a button you can push at the top of the bridge that signals the lights at the bottom of the bridge to tell drivers that a bike is about to come down that bridge would be awesome because you barely have to stop there. Because anyway, so, uh, but again, uh, I'm happy to let Katie go on and make a motion now. Um, before I make a motion, um, one thing I was thinking is if we could capture for the record, the wish list of things we'd like to see, but that so that we don't have to put them in the motion. Um, I, I am aware again, that this is a grant and you need something very specific from us that's grant related. And so maybe we can do that first and then not lard the motion with all the things we like for later. Um, uh, and if that's, if we can do that for the minutes and as sort of like a parking lot that we can come back to, then I would be happy to make a very simple motion, which is basically I move that um, we support this grant opportunity, understanding that the final design is yet to be determined, but um, appreciating the addition of safer pedestrian treatments um, in this intersection. So um, I could probably say that more simply, but basically, yes, please apply for this grant to do something better for pedestrians and bikes at the intersection. And then we're gonna come back later with all the other things we want you to do. Is that, Adina's frowning. Um, well, so somebody can, Somebody can second, and then we can uh, maybe add some friendly amendments that aren't overly constraining. I'll second. Sorry. Um, so, um, uh, so what if we added um, and and to like an encouraging? Um, I'm gonna say two different things. Um, first of all. Um, uh, encouraging staff, staff to um, pursue treatments that um, improve the um, visibility um, to drivers, um, particularly being attentive of the direction that there's a pattern of collisions with um, southbound drivers and bicyclists coming down off the ramp. Um, does that 
seem like a fair addition that is goal oriented and not overly constraining? I think that's reasonable. Um, does it? Yeah, I'm fine with that. That's Maybe. fine, but from a staff perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to defer to Kevin on this, but we may need you in your motion to support the resolution. Is that right? Yeah, Kevin? I think that was the first part. That was that was the first part okay. of the motion to support the, the, the staff support record. the resolution. The motion should support, but yes, support the resolution. Thank you. Be it resolved that we support the resolution. Also, we support the revolution. Um, <laughs> <laughs> also, can I just say now? That when John Cromie said we should really explore the space, I immediately went to the more cowbell sketch from Saturday Night Live, and am I the only person that went there? Um, okay, that's all. That is exclusively why I use that phrase. Okay. <laughs> all right, and then um, the the other uh, suggestion, which the maker of the motion may uh, uh, take or say, like like no, let's bring this to council is to recommend a stop sign because of the particular characteristics of this intersection as borne out by a pattern of collisions. Um, is that something we can fit in the motion? I was prepared to just run to council with that, but is it more helpful for us to put it in the motion? It seems a little passive aggressive to me to um, not put it in the motion and then bring it separately to council. It's definitely part of this grant, right? So the motion is about the grant, and that's it's, not something they're going to fold in. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, if I can just jump in here, we, we wouldn't include the stop sign in the grant. If we were going to do the stop sign, we would do it independently and separately, and so whether it's in the motion or not, maybe isn't a huge consequence, but I don't think it needs to be in. And we've, I think we've heard you very clearly and, and some of we can discuss and, and, um, and potentially bring forward to council as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the um, like I, I, I hear staff concern that if you like cry wolf with stop signs and drivers not, might not pay attention to it, but this is a really distinctive situation where drivers are lulled into not expecting what will happen. So, um, all right. So, so, are we, so, so I'm, I, were we putting that in the motion or not putting it in the motion? Uh, let's, let's separate it out. Um, maybe we can make another, hmm, we probably can't make a motion about a stop sign because it wasn't on the agenda. Kevin. Um, we, we do all, all the time when we have items coming before us with a safety improvement and we make motions to vary how the safety improvement will be done. So we, we could certainly do that. If you, if you say I'm not going to accept it in the friendly amendment, I'll accept it as a friendly amendment. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? So um, if if in the future stop signs were a beginning of a conversation, is that a thing that would come back to the complete streets or would that just automatically go on because you already know that we want them? I mean, I guess my question is, is, is it need to be in the motion right now if they would come back before complete streets anyway, or is that not a thing that we do? We could make it get done faster if we said we wanted it anyway, and then you wouldn't feel like you had to come back to us and you could go straight to council. Maybe. Because I feel like having you guys jump through that extra hoop and write an extra staff report. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> I'm just saying like, like the bureaucratic hoops are legendary. Right. I mean, I, in the end, I would like the grant to happen so that we can have some treatments on the street that will make it safer. And so I, whatever it is that we need to pass to make the grant happen, that would be great. And I think it's probably not enough. Mm -hmm. There's a question like, will putting the stop sign in the motion make it any harder to get the grant? 
No, I don't believe so. So to, to his point, um, <clears throat> I think staff is comfortable with the stop sign request being part of the motion, as long as the commission as a whole recognize that we are submitting a grant uh, as is, and then the, the two kind of your, what you consider to be friendly amendments will be considered once we um, begin the actual design phase of the project. Um, so it would essentially be separate from the grant. So I think staff is comfortable with that approach. Okay, sounds good. So let's do that. Let's have the motion be first the resolution and then Adina's two friendly amendments, one about the intersection treatments that are fancy um, and two about the uh, our desire to see um, the stop sign configuration match the stop sign configuration on the other side, um, despite the lack of warrant. Right. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so I, I was the only point I would point to that would be you know to if, if there's any commissioners that doesn't like any of the um, uh, the the, um, the friendly amendments we would certainly want to hear that because then uh, as a result of this um, most likely we'll need to go to the city council for the stop sign because of the fact that it's not warranted and likely not warranted even if we're doing a study right now um, so um, like like commissioner Bruzzi was saying we'll likely have to go to this uh, city council for this but not necessarily returning to the to the commission are there any people who want to talk about the stop sign thing I'm looking at Kermi and Altman because I haven't heard from them yet. I, I'll start again. Can, what? So, uh, so, so, so the question here is: we want to we want to have a vote on this on this grant um, that we've added on a desire to see the same stop sign configuration on the Ringwide Wood side of the branch, of the bridge that we have on the Van Buren side, um, so that to to reduce the frequency of cyclists getting broadsided or the the, the crashes that we've seen. Um, and because even though we understand that there's probably not a warrant for it, there wouldn't be one for the other side either. The levels of traffic are pretty similar. And on the other side, the the, 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 the scary thing worried about, which is that people would run that stop sign, doesn't seem to have resulted in any bike accidents. So, so basically we're suggesting um, that um, council consider encouraging public work staff to add a stop sign to Van Buren anyway, um, instead of having to do a big study about it. I, I definitely like that idea. I mean, whether there's agreement or not, it sounds like a real dangerous intersection. Um, maybe we've not gotten an email from some resident there. <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe that's the way to short circuit this. Maybe the thing I've learned is just get somebody to send an email, you know, hey, people are going too fast on Van Buren. Um, we asked for it during the TMP and Jackie's emailed about there's, it. Like there's, 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 five, there's five initiatives on the TMP uh, for it. So um, that's, I'm, I'm for it. I, I would support the second piece about this. Okay, great. We just didn't want to actually lose votes on the grant by adding the friendly amendment. Got it, cool. So should we vote? Is there any more discussion? Yeah, this bridge went in uh -huh. in 2020 and it was a set of accidents waiting to happen since 2012. Um, the, uh, can staff help us vote? Right, yeah, so we have a motion and a second on the table. So commissioners that would like to vote yes, you can raise your hand, hold it up for a couple of seconds. Uh, I'm seeing all the hands, so great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, right. Thank you all. Appreciate the good conversation. All right, and 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 thanks to staff for doing the work to make designs to make this safer um, for people, including the youth who use the street often. Moving on back to the agenda. Oh, wait, can we also uh, thank our former commissioners for keeping their eye on the ball and and supporting safety and um, sharing their thoughts with us? Um, uh, they, they have just uh, fled, so I think sending emails thanking former commissioners okay. for uh, 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 raising the level of alert on this is uh, good. Um, all right, coming back to the agenda, 
um, where we are uh, once again evaluating commission subcommittees to support city council priorities. Um, if uh, Kevin Chen can help us with whatever else uh, cleanup we need to do with our subcommittees at this time. Great, thank you very much, Madam Chair. So yes, we are putting this item <clears throat> really for two purposes. One, we already have two fairly fruitful discussions on this. So wanted to take this opportunity to see if there's any loose ends that we need to tie it up. Um, <clears throat> if not, um, I, I think we, from staff's perspective, I think we're at a pretty good place with all the subcommittees and um, sort of the, the charges and uh, uh, the purposes of each. Uh, and then we'll just continue forward um, as they are currently laid out. The second point, uh, the second purpose is that I wanted to highlight the uh, neighborhood traffic uh, NTMP program, the neighborhood traffic management program. So as many of you know, it is one of the items that were directed by the city council to be evaluated by, by the commission. Um, <clears throat> of course, with the end product being some type of a recommendation that will ultimately be presented back to the city council for approval. And as a result of that, uh, staff will be taking the initiative um, at a little bit later on, most likely at the early next, next year or so, uh, to really look at the, the, the program a little bit more closely and look for opportunities to, to revise it and improve it um, in the way that we have been, been wanting to in the past years. So the, <clears throat> the, one of the reasons why uh, staff is also creating, uh, keeping this item on the agenda for the time being is to see if there's any subcommittees uh, that would be interested in working with staff on, on, this, on this journey. Um, like I mentioned, staff will be taking a lead on this, uh, will be, um, evaluating uh, coming up with recommendations, but we will certainly welcome participation from a, from a subcommittee member. And, and ultimately, as, as you know, ultimately the, the recommendation will be coming to the commission anyways. So it will be good to have, a, to have a, um, a sounding board from one of the commission, from one of the subcommittees as we go down the journey here. So uh, with that in mind, I will um, conclude my remark and, and open to the floor. I think we had talked about that going into the TMP subcommittee. I could be wrong. Um, am I wrong? Is my memory accurate? Is, do I think um, you remember that too? Yeah, we had mentioned there were two different ideas that were suggested, and one was putting it into TMP implementation, and the other was creating an, um, an, an ad hoc committee for the purposes of working on this project. Mm -hmm. So maybe the question is, are there people who are not on the TMP subcommittee who feel called to spend time on this, in which case we should do an ad hoc thing? That would be, I'm looking at, I guess, Lydia and Kromi, because Sebria and Altman and Nadina and I are all on the TMP subcommittee. <clears throat> I can't take anything else on right now. Uh, I'm happy to have the, you know, the, the the combined your combined brain power to think about this topic. Mm -hmm. um, so de depending on what happens with our subcommittee report and what staff has to say about the next steps from our subcommittee report um we may like well, actually let me phrase this as a question um does staff think that there's going to be anything like coming to us an opportunity to meet between now and our next meeting uh, on the topic of the ntmp or on the on the other topics on the topic of the, NT, on the, top of the N ntmp definitely I, I think there's definitely an opportunity between now to the end the next meeting for for staff to sit down with uh, the tmp implementation subcommittee, if, if so be it, um, to have a conversation prior to the next meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, ah, so, so that goes in the different direction of what I was going to suggest because there are um, some of the people that are not here are, are newer commissioners who might be interested in this topic. So we could wait and see if they are interested in this or just kind of um, forge ahead and take it on. Um, so 
I don't have, uh, in, hmm, can, can we, in terms of the agenda, um, hold on to this and come back to it after our subcommittee report and how much that generates follow-up work for us between now and the next meeting? Yeah, absolutely. And and if the if the chair and the commission as a whole wants to hold off on assigning this to a subcommittee until the entire nine members of the commission is uh, available, I'm I'm certainly open to that conversation as well because we it's not something that we'll be able to get into uh, right away. Anyways, so most likely it'd be early next year. So this opportunity for us to come back and revisit this topic, I just wanted to bring it to attention tonight. That's all. Okay, because if, if it will be early next year, then I want to, um, well, let's, let's, let's get through the subcommittee reports and then maybe revisit it depending on um, how much is on our plate based on that subcommittee report. Sure, so. Um, let's see. So I know before we get to the subcommittee report, it's usually uh, staff to update the commission with major project status. So I'll go ahead and keep this brief. Um, yep, thank so, you. So we have two projects uh, that I wanted to bring to your attention. One is the quiet zone. So for that project, staff is anticipating to go to the rail subcommittee next Monday. So it's a five o'clock evening meeting. For those that are interested, definitely feel free to participate. The purpose of the meeting will be introducing a, uh, a scope of work for the quiet zone for the approval and, and evaluation from the subcommittee. So definitely if it's an area of interest to you, I just highly recommend attending that meeting. Uh, the second one is the Garwood left turn restriction that the, uh, the, the commission voted on last, last week, um, not last month. So that item we're anticipating to go to the city council next Tuesday. And happy to announce that as part of the recommendation, we are also recommending the uh, to restrict uh, left turn coming out of Merrill. Uh, staff had a chance to look at the volumes. They were relatively low and we're not anticipating a, a major operational impact uh, as a result of that. However, with Alma, it does, uh, there are quite a bit of volume uh, being a left turn coming out of Alma. So at this moment in time, what we'll be recommending is to um, to observe it a little bit more, wait for the wait for the Garwood and uh, Merrill term restriction to be implemented, and then in the future to take this <coughs> take this back on in the future because it will require some additional um, operation analysis. So with that, I will conclude my announcements uh, updates. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so on. Uh, G1, the Climate Action Plan Subcommittee, um, which is, this, this is the project uh, chartered with the goals of figuring out if we want a goal for the city to um, uh, achieve our climate goals. And we have not done anything on that in the last month. Um, and I guess the question there is that was kind of G G1 was was pending having staff resources available to work on that project. So um, like it is um, like with you present, are there now staff resources to work on this project or shall we continue to wait for some future time and keep asking? <laughs> uh, yeah, so <clears throat> I, I think with regard to this particular item, it actually might be beneficial, perhaps um, similar to the um, NTMP program, to have staff and the subcommittee to have maybe an offline meeting just to discuss some of the, um, the nuances and the scope that we're anticipating. Because as many of you know, depending on what the scope will look like, obviously you'll have a, a uh, impact to, to resources needed to accomplish that goal. So at this point, I, what I would recommend is for, uh, for staff and the subcommittee members to maybe try to set up a meeting offline um, and, and discuss some of the high level, have that high level conversation first and then, and then kind of go from there. Um, sounds great. Um, moving on to G2, any updates? Oh, hey, wait, wait, hang on, hang on one second. 
Um, yeah. Just a quick question. Um, I believe I'm on the subcommittee in order to weigh in on the housing element. Is that right? Was that, I'm just trying to remember what, how I ended up on the subcommittee because <laughs> I think it was specifically um, to possibly weigh in on the housing element when it came around to the point where it was ready to be evaluated. Does that sound right to you, Adina? Uh, no, this is no. about coming up with a goal for um, uh, walking and biking and transit as it relates to achieving our climate goals. Oh, okay. Got it. Um, all right. Well, if I if I raise my hand for that, then so then great. I'm happy to help sure out. That wasn't Jensen who raised his hand for that. Was is this possibly a, a mistake? Um, yeah, that's why I'm wondering. I'm like, I don't know if I remember. Maybe someone can check yeah. the old minutes for that. But yeah. I know that Jensen wanted zero emissions. Right. So so you know maybe there was a miscommunication. I, I do recall. Uh, what, what Commissioner Lee was talking about in terms of um, maybe having another subcommittee to to discuss the housing element. I recall at the last meeting there wasn't uh, that much that much interest from other commissioners. So what we ultimately ended up was for both Commissioner Lee and Levin to talk offline to see if that's something that we want to pursue further. Right. Uh, because there are, there are two ways that we can go kind of we can go about it. One is to again form a subcommittee if there's enough interest. But if not, then uh, allowing the individual members to to you know pursue pursue any um, future endeavors as an individual as a member of the resident of Menlo Park. Got it. So either I I don't know if I remembered incorrectly or um uh, but but um or there was more than one direction here. But I had corresponded with. Jackie on that under uh, multimodal as a policy topic, not multimodal metrics, but multimodal subcommittee. And so we had a report under that. And there is a space there um, for Commissioner Lee to work with me and or Mr. Sebrian. So we, uh, like I'll bring up what that correspondence was, and then we can take the next steps to that and we will get to that in G4. Okay, well, I'm, 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 if there's something that I can help out with the Climate Action Plan Submini, that's, I'd be happy to, but I don't remember raising my hand for that. So that's just, I'm just wondering. Well, yeah, would, you, uh, would you be interested in working on like what the city, like whether the city should have any more concrete goals about the amount of box biking and walking in transit? in order to help us achieve our oh, climate right, action. right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, okay. It's coming back to me now. Yeah, and, and at the end of this, uh, we'll be able to go back to E4 if Commissioner Lee doesn't want to, um, no longer sees a need to, to participate in this, then, then obviously we can, we can easily remove you from the list. But, but mm -hmm. uh, Chair Levin, to Chair Levin's point, you know, one of the things that we're trying to accomplish with this is to establish uh, a climate action goal for right. the city. Uh, so that that would be that would be kind of that high level conversation. I okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, I remember now. Okay. Thanks. All right. Cool. Um, moving on to G to downtown access and parking. Um, any update from that subcommittee? Um, if there is none, um, in, in public session, I will share something, which is that the City of Mountain View on Tuesday, uh, Mountain View City Council approved a downtown parking and access strategy that includes, uh, it's a multi-dimensional strategy to um, make better use of their available parking, um, including by managing the pricing of parking permits including the addition of paid on-street parking, including a transportation demand management policy for the downtown, um, and, um, you know, and, and then only after, like, improving signage for available parking and doing all of those things before considering building new parking. So 
um, I, my personal opinion is that is an excellent model that um, should Menlo Park be considering parking management in the future, um, we should look to as a model. Um, uh, G3, this subcommittee met and um, Commissioner Baruzzi, who is off camera, um, had uh, written up a uh, notes from that meeting. Um, is Commissioner Baruzzi uh, perhaps available to report from our subcommittee? And if not, I think that we should move on and then come back to that because I'm back. I'm back. Okay. okay. Um, sorry, I had to take a very fast bio break. Um, so yeah, really quickly, um, we had a great meeting with, hold on, let me close the door because I have people in my house. Um, <laughs> sorry, apologies. Okay, so so we had a great meeting, meeting a couple of days ago with Hugh. It was a wide ranging meeting. We talked about a lot of things. Um, let me see if I can quickly summarize. Um, basically, our um, we were discussing multimodal uh, safety and access metrics. Um, and we determined that there are basically two different pathways to think about multimodal metrics. One is the network metric, right? So basically, do we have, um, do we have good bike and ped networks? Where are the gaps in the networks? How can we plug those in? Um, we um, ideally would be using the TMP to determine what the networks are, but maybe batching elements of the transportation master plan together. So for example, not just building an undercrossing at middle, but building an undercrossing and tagging on a bunch of treatments to middle avenues so that the, there's an actual nice corridor there. Um, that's one approach. But then the other approach that we were talking about was um, not just when we have development, but development is especially timely, um, that, that we add some um, impact analysis metrics that are not just about level of service. Um, so typically when we have big developments, they have to do a transportation impact analysis. And then they're often required to mitigate some of the things that, that, um, that might happen if there's gonna be more traffic, for example. And we've just never had in those guidelines anything about bike and ped safety or access. And uh, we still have a lot more developments coming down the pike. Um, and uh, so what we talked about as a committee was, um, what's the mechanism by which we can start to see safety metrics for bikes and pedestrians baked into those metrics such that it automatically, you know, companies that are hiring some external agency to do an impact analysis will be looking at bike and ped as well as, as level of service or whatever else. And, and beyond that, how can we encourage the city to bake those, that kind of analysis into um, other streetscape changes? So not just if a developer is coming in and building a big building, but also if we're, if we're um, adding a turn lane or repaving or adding a loading zone. Um, we saw as recently as I think we had a Ravenswood project a while back, um, back when we still had Bill Kirsch on the commission and Bill got really upset because um, in the Ravenswood project, um, you know, he and John Weiner had proposed something to do with, you know, making it a safer pedestrian crossing across from the train tracks at the library and adding an island and sort of narrowing the gap for pedestrians. And um, because the impact analysis that we were doing for that was level of service, in other words, like how much, how much farther a car is gonna back up, then um, you know, that was basically, that, that plan was not proposed by staff because they were concerned about the level of service impacts because that's the way our city typically does this. So what we were talking about was, okay, how can we, how can we more fairly evaluate the trade-offs to bikes and pedestrians so that we're not always just looking at level of service? Um, and Hugh was telling us that um, there are actually, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here, the um, Federal Highway Safety um, uh, Administration has been coming up with interesting metrics. It's really a matter of us sharing that we want this to start happening um, and getting council to ask staff, I think, to prioritize it. Um, I don't think we should be inventing the metrics necessarily, but I think it's the idea, it's, it's really elevating the idea that this needs to start being part of the process. Um, the other thing we talked about was um, 
we were encouraging staff to avail themselves of the latest bike and ped mobility pattern data. Um, so we, you know, streetlight data, anything else that we have, any other resources we have to understand as we're starting to make changes to streetscapes or have developments, where are the bikes and peds happening? Like what's happening here? How, where are the, where are the turning movements? Where are the crossing movements? Um, I, th I just think it would be great to start to, to use that data and in, in our analysis and to see it show up more. Um, and sorry, I'm being really wordy and it's super late. Um, but for uh, I think for our next steps, what we would love to do is is ask staff um, if they can bring this back as a topic, um, with the understanding that it would go to council. Um, if they if staff could bring us something to approve to recommend to council, uh, focused on the safety uh, impact analysis, I think first, um, understanding that all of it is important. Did I get that right, Adina Brian? Okay. We also talked a lot about how the TMP has all these great goals and metrics and things that are proposed, but they don't seem to be filtering through to the individual project level all the time. Um, and we talked about more things around the TMP, but really focusing right now on the metrics, what we'd love to do is see staff come back with safety metrics um, uh, for bike and ped. Okay, uh, yes, uh, great. Thank you for that uh, great and robust summary. And um, uh, we had a, a great meeting with, with you and was wondering if, uh, uh, th there are any thoughts about um, what the next steps are and when those would happen in some way that is uh, functional for staff. Sure. Um, yeah, and, and agree. Great conversation. Um, I do think that um, there are, uh, you know, I think Katie laid out really well there. There are a handful of uh, actions that they, there are a handful of things that we could do. There's some things that maybe we already have uh, in place, but um, probably we need to do a little bit of prioritization. And I think I think I had suggested that because it it has been already raised by a council that we look into an update to our TIA guide our traffic impact analysis guidelines that we used uh, to evaluate development projects that's already been flagged as something that that they want to see us work on so we already have some direction uh, for that um, uh, at least in principle um, if not maybe in in funding at this time um, and so um, I think it makes some sense uh, to start there recognizing that all things are are important um, and I think what we can do, it, it, you know, I, I know, Katie, you sent some notes around and maybe what we can do and, and then and describe them very well. It's just kind of memorialize like what the findings were, um, I would say, and um, what the kind of direction from that subcommittee was. And assuming there's some kind of general concurrence from, from the commission, then we can use that to help uh, have sort of an internal conversation next about um, what we what steps we can take to start that process um, and and what resources we'll need to complete it uh, for the for that first sort of bringing uh, metrics into the um, into the TIA guidelines uh, analysis process um, and and I think the just to, there are there are things that we can potentially build on that other others are doing right now uh, that with luck will make that uh, maybe the first iteration of that, let's say a, a smaller update possibly, which which uh, could be easier than if we try to sort of do it all from scratch ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds good. And so is there anything that we might expect and intend to do as a subcommittee between now and our next meeting, um, you know, and, and looking to guidance from staff about the timeline on this? That's a very good question. Um, um, sorry, I was just sending my younger son to bed there. Uh, the uh, um, uh, I don't think there's anything immediate necessarily, um, other than maybe just to to reconvene potentially to just review and, and make sure there's sort of general agreement on the on what those proposed next steps are. But um, you know, once we sort of all look at the notes and, and agree that we're heading in the right direction, but assuming there's sort of general agreement, it seems like the next step is in our court to start to um, sort of flesh out what the, the effort looks like for to do the first of those steps. 
Okay. Um, great. Thank you so much. I'm glad to see some incremental forward motion on this topic where in order to align the city's actions with uh, more of the city council's policy goals. Um, all right, so for the next subcommittee, I wanna look up, um, this is the thing that uh, Commissioner Lee was also uh, interested in. And um, I believe it is next week that the Housing Commission is having a meeting where it's gonna to start to make recommendations about areas for policies to support um, housing production in the housing element. And um, the email correspondence was some fairly straightforward things, um, including, um, uh, making some recommendations on policy areas, including uh, lower parking requirements for um, housing and particularly uh, potentially affordable housing, transportation demand management policies for housing, and uh, maybe uh, bicycle parking, and to make those um, recommendations so that um, to facilitate the creation of more housing with less traffic um, and I did not like I thought I might go back and look up in the um, uh, general plan about exactly what the stats are and maybe have more, like, more specific ideas but I did not do that I just think that um, like those are some areas like in parking it is Useful. There, there's some areas of town where we require. There's a good case we made that we require too much parking, and that constrains the amount of housing that can be built. And we have opportunities to do more policies to help people drive less. Um, so. Um, and I, that, like that, that is like because this is a committee report. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to vote on something. But I guess um, the the two questions are: um, do the, do those things seem sufficiently reasonable that um, I could uh, report as a subcommittee member saying that complete chief commission is like ha has some subcommittee thinking along these lines. And then um, is Commissioner Lee interested in working on uh, supporting those things and maybe doing any additional detail if we come up with any? Um, so I, I think that all those things sound totally reasonable in terms of, you know, how can our housing um, policies um how how can our housing policy how you know what 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 guidelines we have how can that how can that improve you know get again getting more housing and minimizing traffic because that's always the concern with any development right um adding all those new people i mean beyond things like you know impacts on local schools and things like that um, the thing that people always bring up is traffic right so um you know how do we make that housing as appealing as possible and not create more traffic. Um, in terms of like me personally um, helping out, I guess I would be curious to know what your time frame for working on this is. I am pretty booked right now. I'm like overcommitted from now till the end of the year, essentially, with projects that I've already signed up for. So if if this is like um, a lot, if there's a lot of research involved in finding out like what other cities have proposed, you know, what makes sense? Is there a be, you know gold standard for you know uh, alternative transit friendly housing, you know, um, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to do between now and the end of the year. Uh, yeah, so the floor here is silent. So I think that, like, if you're agreeing with those basic points, like the minimal to, to do is to um, 
you know, like basically just say those high level points and, you know, hoping that, you know, staff may have capacity to flesh things out and, you know, Maximal is doing research, but the minimal is making the point as opposed to being silent on it. Okay, I'm making the point where? To city council to hear where? Um, so, so I think the first place to make the point to is in the housing commission agenda item. Um, and then it's going to come to city council. I don't know what the date is it's coming to city council. But like contributing to making the point to the commission and city council with any extra detail being gravy. Oh, okay. I, I'm still not exactly sure how, how, where these, where my voice might be useful. I can maybe jump in here. Yeah. And, um, so uh, the next housing commission meeting would be next Wednesday. I think collectively as a whole, what staff is looking for would be whether or not um, the commission as a whole would be comfortable with uh, Chair Levin being at those meetings, talking about those highlight highlighted points that she just mentioned in the capacity of uh, a commission subcommittee member. I think that's-, that's Oh, helpful. okay, yes, absolutely. I would be definitely yeah. comfortable having you make all those points at official and at, at representing the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then would you, would you want to join the subcommittee for the purpose of maybe doing additional research after the first of the year? Um, sure. Okay, because also um, Commissioner Sebrian was saying that she's pretty tapped out and, you know, may, may not have attention to do that. So if you might have attention after the turn of the year, that would be great. Okay, yeah, let's okay. revisit. Okay, great. So that is the end of that report. Um, let's see, where, look back at the agenda. Um, yes, we, we got the report earlier that there is money falling from the sky from the federal government. So hopefully, whether or not there's an earmark, hopefully we'll be able to fund the undercrossing. And um, that money has the potential to help with things like um, uh, grade separations. There's some some of the new federal funding that was that uh, passed Congress um, has categories that apply to grade separations. Um, so that's good. Um, it does not have um, operating funding, and public transit is ridership is recovering very is slowly from COVID, and so there might be other sources of state or regional funding to help with public transit recovery. And um, I, with a nonprofit hat on, I wrote a blog post on this, basically very lightly summarizing things that were in two different MTC reports. So I can send that to the commission if I remember, if anybody's interested. Um, G5, Safe Routes to School, does that subcommittee have anything to report? Um, I can raise my, I can make um, some quick announcements. Um, so there, there have been, there has been for some time, some real interest in, in creating a lightweight bike education program for kids who are starting to bike to middle school. And so there is a parent at Ensenal who's very enthusiastic about working on this. And so um, Katie and I met with with her and um, who else was there? Oh, Andre Ann from the city and discussed what this might look like and how we can poach from Palo Alto's program. And um, so I think this represents a slightly different shift in how we have been thinking about um, bike education for that age group, which is in the past, I think there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of enthusiasm for hands-on learning. And I think in our experience over the last several years, we've realized that, that it's, it's just very difficult logistically to pull that off in any meaningful way. So we're switching to sort of a more um, uh, in-classroom approach that 
will still will be have more um, substance than and go into details beyond just you know you need to wear a helmet. So uh, which will I'm sure will include that as well. So anyway, I guess the good the good news is that there is some um, efforts to to do something instead of just um, wishing that we had something. Katie, is there anything you want to add to that? Okay. Um, all right, so there's one more thing I want to um, uh, toss into this subcommittee because I forgot to say it when we were making our motion on Ringwood and Van Buren, which is that if there has not been a safe route to school treatment for uh, uh, MA and um, then maybe there should be. So I think a walk audit is good, but um, there's bike issues that may or may not be fully addressed. Um, and so if the, like, we'll uh, recommend to the Safe Routes subcommittee to uh, look into what Safe Routes to School um, proactive approaches might be warranted from that area. And um, our city council liaison, council member Taylor, um, asked me about this, and I recommended that she talk to the Safe Routes to School subcommittee. So I have forwarded that concern, which, um, and that's what I had to say. Um, I have one more thing. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, I um, and I and actually, uh, Kevin and um, and Hugh were also there. Um, I did a, a site visit um, with Mayor Combs and some local residents of the Willows last week um, of the Gilbert Avenue corridor, um, which there have been a lot of concerns about. Uh, and we were looking at kids and buses and pedestrians and people parking to use the dog park and this whole, um, you know, cars crossing Gilbert at Pope and trying to, and discussing, you know, potential ideas for making it a safer, more predictable corridor for everybody. Um, and I don't have really anything else to report on that, except that it was, um, I, I really appreciate, and I think we should do more of this, um, getting council members out on the street, looking at things in real time at the time when they're funky. Um, uh, I did hear from Mayor Combs later that he was especially appreciative of the fact that I had encouraged us to be there at three instead of four, because there was a lot more going on at that point. Um, and so I, um, I'm excited to think, to hear that there's, you know, to know that there are people on the street who are paying attention and that Mayor Combs is interested. It was really great to have um, the staff there. Thank you, Kevin and Hugh. Um, and I'll update you as things progress. Oh, so really quickly, Didian, to your point about um, safe routes around MA, there, Kevin, didn't you just mention there was some sort of task force that's looking at that, right? That there was possibly room for one person from commission to be as part of that. And I think we suggest Jackie, maybe. I, this there is was the yeah. Ringwood task force and um, both. Uh, was uh, Vice Chair Cole and yeah, Vice Chair Cole and I were had both expressed interest, um, and I think now we're just waiting to hear. Right, so that's okay. sort of a. So, so can whoever it is who's working on things um, reach out to Council Member Taylor, who is basically asking, like, how does this work, and what's been done, and what needs to be done. So um, following up with council member Taylor on this would be helpful. And just to add to that staff on, on our end, I will uh, work with our colleagues to see, well, first, if, if a, a safe route to school study have been done for MA, uh, and if so, we'll find records of it. And then, and then of course, if not, then, then obviously we'll, we'll be um, working through the safe route to school coordinator um, to address this issue. Actually, mm -hmm. I appreciate right. the idea of having a council member potentially invited to be part of the Ringwood Task Force. And I think that, you know, that might be something to see if Council Member Taylor would be interested in. All right. I think that's a good idea because she was sharing 
a bunch of different things that I am not sure I have thoroughly captured. And so that might be the best way to thoroughly capture the things that she has in mind. Um, okay, great. Um, so I think that G3 and G6, there was that meeting probably covered multimodal metrics and some TMP implementation without Commissioner Sebrian, which um, Jackie, I hope you are not feeling too badly left out based on what you replied on the other subcommittee. I hope not. So. Um, I'm totally fine not having extra things right now. Okay. Um, on G7, Zero Mission Subcommittee, um, Commissioner Cromie, has anything happened with zero emission vehicles? We were, there was some um, discussion about um, recovering uh, Evan's work on uh, the scooters, but uh, nothing has, nothing has effectively happened on that, so, no. Um, I, I saw a Rivian pickup truck on the street. Yeah, the guy who uh, leads our, uh, my son's scout troop, uh, got one of the first hundred. Was it a gray one or a white one? I think it was the gray one. Okay, if the gray one, that was probably him. I think there's, there's two that I've seen. They're very cool. All right. I was like hearing that there, there, there are some in production and it's very few. So that was a rare and special moment. Um, uh, they're nothing compared to our airplanes, though. Those are going to totally blow you out of the blow you out of the water. So we should put a uh, we should put an air park um, in downtown Menlo Park on top on top of whatever future parking structure they actually decide to put in, because uh, it's right smack in the middle of uh, uh, San Francisco to SJC. So it'd be it'd be the right spot. Uh, all right, we're we're going to have vertical takeoff and 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 landing. Here, here in Menlo Park sooner rather than later. Um, with that extremely serious comment, um, uh, I think um, it is, ah, so, so we, we did not, um, uh, so, so in, in terms of the, the um, NTMP, I think it would be good to come back to that um, next month when there's some newer commissioners to see if any of them are interested in, um, in Engaging in that and then in what configuration. So, because unless staff thinks that it's more urgent than that, then I think that we should offer people the opportunity to get involved in that topic. Staff agrees. Okay. Um, thank you very much to all and sundry for engaging in our uh, substantive topics and subcommittees and whatnot. So, with that, um, Thanks to all, and the meeting is adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.